by their very nature the concern of all states and, and I quote, in view of the importance of the rights involved, all states can be held to have a legal interest in their protection, end of quote. Given the character and the importance of the rights and obligations involved, it follows that all states are under an obligation not to recognize the illegal situation resulting from the occupation of the Palestinian territory. They are also under an obligation not to render aid or assistance in maintaining the situation created by such occupation. As the court has asserted, and I quote, it is also for all states, while respecting the UN Charter and international law, to see to it that any impediment to the exercise by the Palestinian people of its right to self-determination is brought to an end." End of quote. Finally, Colombia believes that states must cooperate within the multilateral framework of the United Nations. In the present situation, the organization, and especially the General Assembly and the Security Council, should consider what further and urgent action is required to bring to an end the illegal situation resulting in the instant request from Israel's illegal occupation. The court's guidance is crucial for that purpose. Mr. President, to conclude, Colombia respectfully calls upon the International Court of Justice to give the advisory opinion requested by the General Assembly. Ultimately, what is at stake here is ensuring the safety and, indeed, the very existence of the Palestinian people, bearing in mind the real and imminent risk of irreparable prejudice to the rights of Palestinians as a consequence of Israel's occupation as has been fully documented by international agencies, United Nations organs, and even recently recognized by the court itself. As the court stated two decades ago, and one of its members recently recalled, and I quote, the United Nations has a permanent responsibility towards the question of Palestine until the question is resolved in all its aspects in a satisfactory manner in accordance with international legitimacy." End of quote. And so does the court as the principal organ, judicial organ, of those United Nations. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the court. This concludes my presentation on behalf of the Republic of Colombia. I thank the delegation of Colombia for its presentation. I invite the next participating delegation, Cuba, to address the court, I call upon Her Excellency Anayansi Rodriguez Camello to take the floor. Good morning, Mr. President, distinguished members of the court. It is an honor for me to address you on behalf of the Republic of Cuba. On July 2023, the Republic of Cuba presented its written submissions as part of the advisory opinion on the legal implications resulting from Israel's practices and policies in the occupied Palestinian territories. Our delegation appears before this solemn sitting as an expression of Cuba's genuine interest in and commitment to peace and based on its historical and unconditional solidarity with the peoples that are subject to colonialism and foreign domination. The Palestinian people, its girls, boys, women, and civilian population as a whole, continue to be massacred due to the illegal use of force by Israel, the occupying power. At this, all this takes place with the complicity of countries such as the United States of America, 
responsible on the international law for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the apartheid regime that determines where people can live, work, and move around depending on their ethnic and religious backgrounds. Members of the court, we and you bear the high moral, historical, and legal responsibility to pronounce ourselves in a clear, transparent, and forceful manner on the ignominious situation of the Palestinian people and to demand international responsibility for what is happening in the occupied territories. The current context highlights the importance of the questions circulated by the UN General Assembly Resolution 77-247. The presentation of the Cuban delegation has been structured as follows. In the first part, we will discuss the essential legal elements that should serve as the basis for establishing the international responsibility on the, of the occupying power and all other international actors involved. In the second part, we will focus on the legal implications and consequences that should be demanded for such internationally wrongful acts or omissions. Finally, on behalf of the Republic of Cuba, I will present our conclusion on these proceedings. Referring to the first part, the violation of the ban on the, trees, on, on the threat or use of force, equal rights and free determination of peoples have been amply documented before the international community and this very court. Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories is an international wrongful act. The reiteration and duration of which aggravate the responsibility of the occupying power before the Palestinian people and the international community. The prohibition to acquire territories by threat or the use of force is a rule of customary international law with broad regulatory and jurisdictional recognition. This prohibition applies regardless of whether the territory is acquired as a result of an act of aggression or self-defense. The UN Charter, which is the basic international legal instrument for the new international order and the contemporary international law, is very clear in this regard. This treaty, of which the Statute of the International Court of Justice is an integral part, establishes in Article 2.4 that every state shall refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purpose of the United Nations. The Charter itself, in Article 1.2, recognizes as one of its purposes respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, which are systematically and flagrantly denied to the Palestinian people. These violations of general customary international law stand erga omnes. In relation to the specific question before the International Court of Justice, it should be pointed out that since the adoption of Resolution 242-1967 of the Security Council, it was agreed that Israel's armed force would withdraw from all the territories occupied during the 1967 conflict and, the, and that the 1949 Green Line would be recognized as the demarcation of the borders between Israel and Palestine. The occupation of the Palestinian territories is also considered as a wrongful act of annexation in accordance with the provisions contained in Resolution 476 and 478 
of 1980 and 497 of 1981 of the Security Council, which state that the acts of Israel oriented to the annexation of East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights are null and void and should not be recognized by states. These spurious Athens have also included maneuvers to change the international status of the Holy See of Jerusalem. Some states not only recognize and accord legal status to Israel's policies and practices, but act with complicity and blatant impunity to prevent the international community, including the United Nations, from stopping the ongoing genocide. Under the declaration of the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples, adopted by UN General Assembly Resolution 1514, the Palestinian people have the inalienable right to determine their own political, economy, and social destiny. This is in keeping with the recognition of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, peremptory norms endorsed in the UN Charter, the Human Rights Covenants, and the Declaration on Principles of International Law concerning friendly relations and cooperation among states in conformity with the Charter agreed upon by UNGA Resolution 2625. The presence of Israeli settlements in the occupied territories, the forced changes to the demography of the Palestinian people through land occupation and forced displacement of people, the construction of the separation wall, the control exercised over, over their natural resources, and the restrictions imposed on their mobility undermine and deny the ability of Palestinians to exercise their right to self-determination. Israel is also in violation of Resolution 242-1967 of the Security Council and the Oslo Accords. These agreements state that no party shall commence or take any step that would modify the status of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip pending to, to the outcome of negotiations on the permanent status. The destruction and appropriation of property in occupied territories, which are not justified by military necessity and are carried out on a large scale, unlawfully and arbitrarily, constitute great, great breaches of the four Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war and therefore constitute a war crime. The Palestinian question demands a clear statement on the legal, on the legal implications resulting from the non-applicability and violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Land, sea and air blockades constitute collective punishment and are extreme violations of freedom of movement and the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights. Collective punishment is expressly prohibited by international humanitarian law and is incompatible with several international human rights law provisions. The written submission presented by Cuba to this court provides well-documented evidence, particularly the serious violations of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. The genocide against the Palestinian people is not limited to the current state, stage of the extermination war by Israel. All this with the complicity of the United States of America, which prevents the international community from acting to protect the Palestinian people. The justification for fighting terrorists and exercising the right to self-defense 
are deceit, deceitful when they are raised by the aggressors themselves. The legal consequence of current and past events should not be analyzed in a fragmented manner. Taken as a whole, this institu institutionalized violence, which makes no distinction between civilians and combatants, is part of a broader policy that also includes, in a systematic and organized manner, massive confiscations of land and property, unlawful killings, extrajudicial executions, tortured, administrative detentions, forced transfers, restriction of movement, and the denial of nationality and citizenship to the Palestinian population. There is also a discriminatory economic and cultural policy aimed at impoverishing the Palestinian population and denying the realization of their fundamental human rights. The International Court of Justice should make a general assessment of this situation so as, so as to determine the legal implications resulting from it. In this regard, the Republic of Cuba believes that rather than an obvious apartheid regime situation prosecuted as a crime against humanity, this is indeed an act of low intensity genocide that is perpetrated with systematic and effective cruelty. To qualify Israel's action merely as acts of apartheid would, have, would leave out the implicit intention to exterminate the Palestinian people, either in part or as an ethnic and religious group to whom the right to self-determination is denied. In case there was any doubt about the arguments that Cuba presented to the court in its brief, the current situation that is taking place in the eyes of all confirms the ongoing genocide. Innocent victims, girls, boys, women, civilian in general, numbers in the thousands. For the Genocide Convention to apply, the life of one single victim or the incitement, attempts, or conspiracy to commit such acts would be enough. The Convention Against Genocide also punishes the accomplices and instigators, those who veto decisions and prevent the international community and the United Nations from, from taking action, those who oppose an immediate ceasefire and the delivery of humanitarian aid, those who for years have supported each and every one of the policies and practices of Israel the occupying power, which deny the existence of the Palestinian people and their rights. This agenda, to a large extent, has advanced in the course of time. We are convinced that this court should not wait for the complete extermination of an entire nation before ruling on the matter. That was the intention of the UN General Assembly in requesting the advisory opinion. The terrible situation currently facing the Palestinian people is a reminder of the urgency of a clear and consistent statement on the questions submitted, submitted to the consideration of the court. Israel, the occupying power and its alias must take responsibility for the legal implications resulting from the sustained non-compliance with the international law. Consequently, the analysis of the international responsibility of Israel should go hand in hand with the responsibility of the United Nations and the member states that hinder its actions. Created, creating by sustained and continued omission an international wrongful act that aggravates and worsens a clear situation of violation of international law 
in the Palestinian occupied territories. There should be a clear and unanimous ruling by the court that impartially and independently establishes the legal implications resulting from depriving the Palestinian peoples from their fundamental rights, including the right to, li to life, freedom, and self-determination. Mr. President, members of the courts, related to the second part, added to the aforementioned international violations, there is the indolent attitude of Israel, the occupying power, of ignoring the numerous resolutions and decisions adopted by the UN General Assembly, the Security Council, and the International Court of Justice. In this regard, and without intending to cover all issues, our brief to the court contains a report on the violations of the aforementioned provisions. In line with the foregoing and all other relevant opinions that may be contributed by other states, the main legal implication from this violation, resulting from this violation of international law should be the declaration of the international legal responsibility of Israel, the occupying power, and its accomplices. All this based on the series of conventional and customary primary rules of international law that have been violated by Israel. Likewise, the aforesaid responsibilities and legal, legal consequences must be established for Israel and its accomplices in, accord in accordance with the secondary rules of state responsibility for internationally wrongful acts contained in the draft articles of the International Law Commission as reflected in document A5610. It would be appropriate for the court to provide in its advisory opinion that the international responsibility of Israel covers all illicit acts or omission of its state's, state bodies and those executed by persons or entities exercising powers of public authority, acting in the absence of official authorities or under the guidance or control of the occupying power. These secondary rules that govern the international responsibility of states clearly establishes the guidelines to determine the legal implication of the internationally wrongful act. This would motivate a strong ruling of, by the court, indicating the immediate obligation of all states, in particular the occupying power, to comply with the conventional and customary norms flagrantly and systematically violated in the Palestinian territory, including the cessation and non-repetition and reparation for the damage caused to the Palestinian people referred to respectively in Articles 29, 30 and 31 of the draft Articles on Responsibility of States. All of the foregoing is without prejudice to the applicable provisions of treaty law. In addition, the International Court of Justice should separately address the international responsibility of other states for the aid and assistance they offer to Israel, including those that supply weapons. It is an undisputed fact that certain members of the organization violate the principles reflected in Article 2 of the Charter, not only by denying the sovereign equality and rights of the, of, of the state of Palestine, but also by acting in bad faith in such a way that precludes any possibility for a negotiated solution to the conflict that far from being resolved has worsened it over the last 70 years. In all these years, the United Nations, the United States has systematically and consistently overused its veto power 
to prevent any effective action by the Security Council and to ensure impunity to Israel. Just yesterday, the U.S. vetoed for the 48th time, 48 time, a Security Council resolution related to the Palestinian question. The International Court of Justice should, should emphasize the scope of Article 2.5 of the UN Charter, which states that all members shall refrain from giving assistance to any state against which the United Nations is taking preventive or inform, enforcement action. This entails the obligation of all states to abide by the decisions adopted by the organization as a whole, particularly when the Security Council remains passive by the indolent attitudes of one of its permanent members, the United States of America. And the United Nations General Assembly has continuously and categorically taken a stand on this question, supported by the International Court of Justice. Mr. President, members of the courts, to conclude, and based on the foregoing and especially taking into account the unbearable situation of the, of, of the Palestinian people, the Honorable International Court of Justice should take a stand in the clearest, strongest, and most forceful legal terms in support of international law. The advisory opinion should establish the legal implications for Israel, other states, and the United Nations for the violation of the norms against the threat or use of force, equal rights and self-determination of people, as well as of the main international human rights instruments, the Geneva Convention on the Protection of Civilian Persons in Time of War, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, and the continued non-compliance with decision of the UN General Assembly, Security Council, and the International Court of Justice. A special pronouncement would be merited by the issues related to the character and status of the Holy See of Jerusalem, Holy City of Jerusalem, in light of the continuous violation by Israel and the regrettable inaction of the United Nations, a direct result of the abusive and irresponsible exercise of the veto privilege in the Security Council. The court should carefully think about the legal implications of these actions or omissions. We understand that once the court has declared the existence of a situation of violation of international law, for example, the commission of a crime of genocide, war crime or crime against humanity, there should be clear legal implications for all states that act in a way that ignores or undermines the decision or opinion of the court. Actions or omissions that support violations of general international law should be held to be incompatible with the exercise of any international privilege. Honorable magistrates, it is up to the International Court of Justice to render the peace and justice that the Palestinian people deserve without political double standards. That is the reason why the delegation of the Republic of Cuba respectfully requests the prompt issuance of an advisory opinion against the many years of genocidal impunity, clearly stating the international implications and responsibilities of those who, on one way or the other, contribute to the extermination of the Palestinian people. The international community requires a pronouncement that makes it clear to those responsible that today they may use their force against the innocent civilians, but this force will not be enough to spare them from justice. I thank you very much. I thank the delegation of Cuba for its presentation. I invite the next participating dele uh, delegation, Egypt,
to address the court and call Ms. Jasmine Musa to the podium. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it is my great honour and privilege to appear on behalf of Egypt, of the Arab Republic of Egypt, in this advisory opinion of historical importance in which the General Assembly is once again seeking the court's guidance in respect of the question of Palestine. This comes against the backdrop of a 75-year history of displacement, dispossession, collective punishment, and daily indiscriminate and systematic violence and human suffering of untold proportions. Mr. President, as we speak, Israel's brutal onslaught continues to rage in occupied Gaza, where 29,000 innocent civilians have been killed and almost 2.3 million people forcibly transferred and displaced in violation of international law. Israel is deliberately and wantonly creating conditions of life that are, that are intended to make life in Gaza impossible, imposing siege and starvation, including by impeding humanitarian access and the distribution of relief through constant obstruction and bombardment. With the impending attack on Rafah, where 1.4 million people have sought refuge, Israel is continuing its policy of mass forcible expulsion of Palestinian civilians, all while the Security Council repeatedly fails to call for a ceasefire in callous disregard for Palestinian life. Simultaneously, Israel is continuing its illegal practices in the West Bank, scaling up attacks, access restrictions, punitive house demolitions, and supporting settler violence that has displaced entire communities. Increased settlement activity continues to erode the basis for a two-state solution, dimming prospects for a lasting peace in the region. These ongoing grave violations of international law by Israel, the occupying power, are part of a wider policy that seeks to dispossess the Palestinians of their land and assert Israeli sovereignty over it. This is manifestly illegal and renders the occupation as a whole unlawful. It is shocking that at this critical moment, some states would rather see this court abscond its responsibility as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations by declining to render this advisory opinion. What message does this send about these states' respect for international justice and the rule of law? Mr. President, I will focus my statement on four main points. Namely, number one, the court's jurisdiction and competence, the legal framework for assessing Israel's prolonged and illegal occupation, which violates non-derogable principles of international law, the purported justifications of self-defense or military necessity, and finally, I will conclude on the legal consequences and a summary of Egypt's submissions. First, on the matter of jurisdiction and competence, the small number of states objecting to the court's exercise of jurisdiction have variously argued that the request is politically motivated, instrumentalizes the court, circumvents the, the, the consent of Israel, covers too vast a scope, or will prejudice the peace process and negotiations between the parties. Let me recall that the court has repeatedly and consistently rejected such arguments. In the Kosovo advisory opinion, the court did not concern itself with the motives which may have inspired the request or the political implications of its opinion. Since the General Assembly is duly authorized under Article 96.1 of the UN Charter and brought forth its request through a validly adopted resolution, the request, in the Court's own words, in principle, should not be refused. In the Nuclear Weapons and Chagos Advisory Opinions, the Court refused to second-guess the decision of the General Assembly, stating that it has the right to decide for itself on the usefulness of an opinion in light of its own needs. Distinguished members of the court, the General Assembly has turned to this august court with what is manifestly a legal question, 
seeking a legal answer that would indisputably assist in discharging its functions. Allow me to recall that this very court in the wall opinion affirmed the UN's permanent responsibility for the question of Palestine until such time as it may be resolved in all its aspects in a satisfactory manner in accordance with international legitimacy. In the wall opinion, the court found no merit in the proposition echoed by some in these proceedings that the ongoing negotiations constituted a compelling reason to decline its competence. It reached a similar conclusion in the nuclear weapons advisory opinion after noting that its opinion would have relevance for the continuing debate on the matter in the General Assembly and would present an additional element on the matter. Indeed, rather than prejudicing the peace process, the present advisory opinion serves not just as an additional element, but rather an essential one for the General Assembly to continue to carry out its role in relation to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This is absolutely critical given the complete absence of any real prospect for a peaceful solution. The court could not possibly turn its back on this wealth of jurisprudence or disregard the many compelling reasons for it to honor the General Assembly's request. As summarized so aptly by the representative of Palestine, the Middle East region yearns for peace and stability and a just, comprehensive and lasting resolution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict based on the principles of international law and the establishment of a viable Palestinian state on the pre-1967 lines with East Jerusalem as its capital. The legal determination by the court in the present advisory opinion is indispensable to guide the General Assembly and the international community to achieve this objective. Second, Mr. President, I turn to the question of the ongoing violation by Israel of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination from its prolonged occupation, settlement and annexation of the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967. Distinguished members of the court, Palestine has been subjected to the longest protracted state of occupation in modern history, as well as de facto and de jure annexation that confirm the unlawful nature of the occupation. Israel's persistent policy of implanting settlements in the West Bank and occupied Jerusalem for the purpose of creating facts on the ground and breaking up the territorial contiguity of the occupied territories is a blatant disregard for international law. Twenty years ago, the representatives of the State of Palestine laid before this court the facts of Israel's intensive settlement and colonization policy, which had, at the time, transferred 400,000 illegal settlers to the occupied Palestinian territories. Today, that number stands at 750,000, deliberately and permanently altering the status of the occupied territories. In addition to the policy of de facto annexation, Israel purported to annex East Jerusalem de jure through the basic law adopted by the Israeli Knesset in 1980, stipulating Jerusalem complete and united is the capital of Israel. The very limited number of states defending these policies advance two principal claims, namely that the legal status of occupation does not change if the occupation is prolonged, or involves illegal violations of Yus and Bello, and that under Yus et Bellum, Israeli occupation is lawful since, inter alia, relevant UN Security Council resolutions did not declare otherwise. Egypt submits that the proposition that occupation is merely a de facto situation whose legality cannot be called into question is seriously flawed. As highlighted by a number of participants, the legality of an occupation must be assessed by reference to the UN Charter and general international law. In fact, Israel's prolonged occupation violates a number of distinct legal regimes that exist and operate simultaneously and concurrently. These include, number one, the law of occupation, part of the Yus in Bello, that's that was characterized by this court as intransgressible. Number two, the jus ad bellum, and the peremptory prohibition of the acquisition of territory through force. 
Number three, the principle of self-determination, also a peremptory norm of international law, described by this court as ergo omnes and irreproachable in the East Timor case. And four, the fundamental prohibition of racial discrimination, segregation and subjugation. It is against this legal framework that the legality of Israel's policies and practices in the occupied Palestinian territories must be assessed. First, with respect to the youth in Bello, it is a fundamental principle of international law that an occupying power is prohibited from changing the status of the occupied territory, as well as its annexation in whole or in part. It is only entitled to exercise limited powers intended to be temporary in nature, with the aim of balancing between its own military needs and the protection of the local inhabitants. These are not rights bestowed on the occupying power, but rather limitations on its authority. It flows from this that belligerent occupation is governed by two key principles. First, it is a temporary regime. And second, it cannot transfer sovereignty to the occupying power. Rather, it freezes the legal order of the occupied territory throughout the duration of the occupation. The occupying authority is merely a de facto administrator, a principle intended to protect both the inhabitants of the occupied territory as well as the separate existence of the state, its institutions and its laws. This is reflected in Article 47 of the Fourth Geneva Convention and is precisely what distinguishes occupation from annexation. The prohibition of permanently changing the occupied territory extends also to its demographic component. Article 49 of the Fourth Convention prohibits individual or mass forcible transfer of civilians outside the occupied territory and the transfer by the occupying power of parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. According to the 1958 commentary, this was intended to prevent a practice adopted during the Second World War by certain powers which transferred portions of their own populations into occupied territory for political and racial reasons and in order, as they claimed, to colonize those territories. As demonstrated in Palestine's statement, there is overwhelming evidence that Israeli support for and maintenance of settlements is intended to permanently alter the demographic composition of the occupied Palestinian territory and extend Israeli sovereignty over it. This is coupled with Israel's mass forcible transfer and forced displacement of the Palestinians in Gaza through its illegal evacuation orders and indiscriminate use of force, which has been labelled by the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the occupied Palestinian territory as ethnic cleansing. It should be highlighted that Article 49 not only prohibits forced transfers, but also in the court's own words, and I quote, any measures taken by an occupying power in order to organize or encourage transfers of parts of its own population into the occupied territory. Numerous resolutions of the General Assembly and Security Council affirmed the illegality of Israel's settlements, annexation and measures altering the demographic composition, character and status of the holy city of Jerusalem, considering them invalid and a flagrant violation of the Fourth Convention, while requiring Israel to desist from such practices. Security Council Resolution 298 stated, and I quote, all legislative and administrative actions taken by Israel to change the status of the, Holy, of the city of Jerusalem, including expropriation of land and properties, transfer of population, and legislation aimed at the incorporation of the occupied section are totally invalid and cannot change that status. 
The Council also declared in relation to Jer Jerusalem in Resolution 478 of 1980 that Israeli legislative and administrative measures are null and void and must be rescinded forthwith. Israel remains in defiance of these and subsequent resolutions, including Resolution 2334 of 2016 and numerous General Assembly resolutions in addition to the provisions of the Geneva Conventions previously described. Israel's prolonged military rule and its strategic settlement policy considered a national value under Israeli legislation is essentially a systemic deep Palestinianization of the occupied territory, including Jerusalem, intended to permanently change its demographic characteristics and enhance its Jewish component, thereby achieving the de jure and de facto annexation of that territory. This leads to the conclusion that Israeli occupation is, in fact, an illegal annexation, conquest and de facto colonial endeavor. Mr. President, the second legal principle by which the legality of Israel's occupation is to be assessed is Article 2.4 of the UN Charter which prohibits the acquisition of territory through force, one of the most fundamental principles of the post-UN Charter era. The vast majority of states participating in these proceedings submit that Israeli occupation, by virtue of its permanence, de jure and de facto annexation, manifestly violates the principle of inadmissibility of acquiring territory through force. Only one state has attempted to justify Israel's actions by contesting the Palestinians' title to the occupied territories and justifying Israel's territorial expansion as the product of a defensive war. Egypt submits that these claims have no basis in fact or in law and seek to derail the court by raising issues outside the temporal scope of this request. They are reminiscent of the archaic international law of the 19th century that justified territorial conquest through denying the sovereign status of colonized peoples, relegating them to the realm of terra nullius. There is also no support for the proposition that Israel was acting defensively in 1967. International law recognizes neither preemptive nor preventive self-defense, and the terms of the UN Charter on this matter are clear, requiring an armed attack to occur in order to trigger the right of self-defense. Israel's attack in 1967 was therefore not a defensive, but an aggressive war. Even if the claim of self-defense were valid, which clearly is not the case, a decades-long occupation is not reconcilable with the customary international law conditions of necessity, immediacy, and proportionality. In any event, the issue is a moot one, as it is universally recognized that a state may not gain title to territory through any use of force, regardless of its purported legitimacy. These claims also find no basis in Security Council Resolution 242, which unequivocally recognized the inadmissibility of acquiring territory through force, demanding Israel's withdrawal from territories occupied in the recent conflict, and emphasizing the duty of all states to act in accordance with Article 24 of the Charter. Resolution 242 was reaffirmed by Resolution 338, while the inadmissibility of territorial acquisition through force was confirmed in at least nine subsequent Security Council resolutions. In fact, Resolution 471 clearly stated, <clears throat> as far back as 1980, the overriding necessity to end the prolonged occupation of the Arab territories occupied by Israel since 1967, including Jerusalem. In Egypt's view, it is clear that under international law, the territorial status of the West Bank, including Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, cannot lawfully be altered through armed conflict. 
Israel's protracted occupation, which is coupled with measures to permanently change the demographic characteristics of the occupied territory and annex part of the land de facto and de jure in violation of the cardinal principle of the prohibition of the acquisition of territory through force is therefore illegal per se and an ongoing violation of international law. Distinguished members of the court, the third legal principle against which Israel's conduct must be assessed is self-determination. Egypt submits that Israel's indefinite occupation amounts to a nullification and denial of the Palestinian people's inalienable right to self-determination. It is indisputable that this right, enshrined in Article 1-2 of the UN Charter and both human rights covenants, is a cardinal principle in modern international law. It is its erga omnes character, confirmed by the court in the East Timor case, entails that all states and international organizations have a legal interest and a duty in respecting and protecting this right. This court already affirmed in the Wall Advisory Opinion the applicability of this right to the Palestinian people. Mr. President, Israel's indefinite occupation of the Palestinian territories is, as a whole, inconsistent with the principle of self-determination and breaches three salient aspects of this principle. First, it obstructs the Palestinian people from freely determining their political status, achieving independent statehood, sovereignty and the right of return. Second, it deprives Palestinians of their right to pursue their economic, social and cultural development. In gross breach of international law, Israel restricts Palestinians' access to Jerusalem's Christian and Muslim holy sites, notably Al-Aqsa Mosque, wantonly depletes Palestinian nat natural resources, imposes access restrictions to Area C, and obstructs the movement of goods and people between the West Bank and Gaza, stunting Palestine's economy and impeding the geographical unity of the state of Palestine. Third, the fragmentation and dismemberment of the occupied territories through Israel's settlements policy, the wall and measures of de facto and de jure annexation are a blatant violation of the fundamental principle of the integrity of the self-determination unit. The territorial unit of Palestine includes both the West Bank, including the holy city of Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. Although Israel withdrew its forces from Gaza in 2005, it still retains effective control by inter alia, exercising complete control over Gaza's airspace and territorial waters, the flow of people and goods in and out of Gaza, the Palestinian population registry, the tax policy and transfer of tax revenues. Israel's continuing military incursions into Gaza, including the ongoing brutal assault, indicate Israel's continuing authority over the territory. Together, the West Bank and Gaza constitute a single territorial unit. This has been confirmed by numerous Security Council resolutions which refer to Gaza as an integral part of the territory occupied in 1967 and of the Palestinian state under the two-state solution. Egypt firmly denounces the ongoing obstruction of the Palestinian people's inalienable, permanent and unqualified right to self-determination, a violation as, arguing, as argued by Palestine that is an essential feature of Israel's prolonged occupation. One only needs to look at Israel's vicious wholesale destruction of Gaza today after years of imposing the medieval methods of siege and blockade to realize the extent of Israel's transgression of this principle. Israel's prolonged occupation is therefore illegal per se and, as an ongoing, and is an ongoing internationally wrongful act that must be immediately brought to an end by Israel by immediately ending the occupation. The fourth legal principle against which Israel's conduct must be assessed is the fundamental prohibition of racial discrimination, segregation and subjugation. 
On a daily basis under occupation, Palestinians face institutionalized discrimination and segregation under a dual legal system applying different laws to Palestinians and Israelis. Israeli military orders in the occupied territories entrench racial discrimination between Palestinians and Israeli settlers. Israel also implements de facto and de jure measures of racial discrimination, including in the areas of detention, criminal justice, housing, land confiscations, and house demolitions. How can such practices, which have been described by a number of participants as crimes against humanity, how can they be consistent with any notion of human rights and human dignity in the 21st century? Israel is under an obligation to repeal all such legislation that maintains its systematic, oppressive and institutionalized policy of racial discrimination and segregation against the Palestinian people and to cease all discriminatory policies and practices. I now turn to whether self-defense or military necessity may justify Israel's prolonged occupation. The argument that a state may exercise self-defense against a territory under its own military occupation and effective control is counterintuitive, particularly since the occupying state has the authority and even the obligation to ensure public order and safety in the occupied territory. In the Wall Advisory Opinion, this Court found that Article 51 of the Charter, which recognizes the inherent right of self-defense, had no relevance as the acts invoked by Israel were acts arising out of the occupied Palestinian territory, which is under Israeli effective control and not imputable to another state. Egypt finds no reason for the court to depart from this considered opinion in the current proceedings. The court also rejected the justification of military necessity the modern conception of military necessity is strictly limited to the contexts in which it is expressly recognized. It is thus already considered in the formulation of the obligations set out in humanitarian conventions, some of which expressly exclude reliance on military necessity. For example, no military necessity qualification is permitted under Article 49, Paragraph 6 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which prohibits the transfer of any part of the occupying power's civilian population into an occupied territory. This cannot be justified as a safety measure taken by Israel in the exercise of its prerogatives as an occupying power. According to the legal maxim, ex injuria jus non oritur, one should not be able to profit from one's own wrongdoing. Israel thus cannot invoke self-defense to maintain a situation created by its own illegal conduct or to justify violations of peremptory norms of international law. Distinguished members of the court, for how much longer do the Palestinian people need to wait before they are able to exercise their legitimate rights under international law? For how much longer will the United Nations continue to manage the humanitarian impacts of Israeli violations without addressing their root cause? History will judge us for how we respond today. Egypt respectfully submits that the court should advise the General Assembly that, number one, the prolonged Israeli occupation is, per se, a continuing violation of international law for its breach of, number one, the jus in bello, number two, the prohibition of the acquisition of territory through force, number three, the right to self-determination of the Palestinian people, and number four, the prohibition of racial discrimination segregation and subjugation. Second, Israel, as the wrongdoing state, is obliged to make full reparation through restitution, compensation and satisfaction 
either singly or in combination, by ceasing immediately and unconditionally its unlawful occupation of Palestinian territory and rescinding the associated unlawful policies and practices of annexation, settlement and discriminatory legislation. Three, all states have a duty not to recognize the illegal situation created by Israel's ongoing violation resulting from its prolonged occupation, settlement and annexation of the occupied territory and not to render aid or assistance in maintaining that situation. Mr. President, the consequences of Israel's prolonged occupation are, are clear and there can be no peace, no security, no stability, no prosperity in the Middle East without upholding justice and the rule of law for the Palestinian people. I thank you. I thank the delegation of Egypt for its presentation. Before I invite the next delegation to make its oral statement, the court will observe a break for 10 minutes. The sitting is suspended.
Please be seated. The uh, sitting is resumed. I now call upon the delegation of the United Arab Emirates to address the court and invite Her Excellency Lana Nusaybe to take the floor. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it is an honour and privilege to appear before you on behalf of the United Arab Emirates. The gravity of the situation we are called to address has compelled the UAE to participate in advisory proceedings for the first time in its history. Allow me to begin by affirming the UAE's recognition of the importance of the court's advisory function in clarifying applicable legal frameworks contributing to peaceful relations between states. This is critical at a time of growing polarization over when and how international law is applied. International law cannot be an a la carte menu. It must apply equally to all. And it is all the more essential in the long shadow cast by the Palestinian question, an injustice that has persisted for more than seven decades and which implicates the most fundamental principles of the international system, of self-determination, of human rights, and of our most basic and universal yearning for peace, justice, and freedom. By responding to the General Assembly's request to render an advisory opinion, the Court will tangibly assist the Assembly's proper exercise of its functions in relation to the question of Palestine. It will also contribute to achieving a peaceful and just resolution of the conflict included in the preservation of the parameters of the two-state solution to which member states have collectively subscribed. This is vital not only for Palestinians and Israelis, but for peace and stability in our region and beyond. The UAE strongly believes that the only path to that just and lasting peace is through the fulfillment of the long-denied right of the Palestinian people to self-determination with an independent and sovereign Palestine based on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital, living side by side with Israel. That right to self-determination and the duty of every member of the international community to cooperate in its fulfillment was expressly recognized in this court's advisory opinion of 2004. Mr. President, rather than repeat the UAE's written statement of July 2023, I will elaborate on five key points here today. My first point addresses the significance of this advisory opinion to the realization of the two-state solution. In so doing, I wish to respond to the claim that in providing an advisory opinion the court would hinder the negotiating process. I will then direct my second submission to the deteriorating situation in the occupied Palestinian territory since the written stage of these proceedings. Third, I will devote some time to East Jerusalem and Israel's violations there, including its annexation of territory and its undermining of the legal and historic status quo. Israel's violations in the West Bank in East Jerusalem and in the Gaza Strip imperil the two-state solution. The conclusion that flows from these violations is that Israel's occupation is illegal. This will be my fourth point. Finally, I will focus on the consequences of Israel's unlawful actions for Israel, for all states, and for the United Nations. I will now address the first point, the two-state solution. The General Assembly and the Security Council, through dozens of resolutions, have entrenched the two-state solution as the basis for peace. This vision necessarily includes the Gaza Strip as part of the Palestinian state, as reaffirmed most recently by the Security Council in Resolution 2720 of 22 December 2023. 
The viability of this vision of peace and of an independent Palestinian state are imperiled by Israeli violations that are the subject of the present proceedings. Since the General Assembly's request to the court in December 2022, these violations and the level of violence have risen sharply. We convene today while Israel's grave violations against Palestinians persist with impunity, four months into its military op operation in Gaza and following four failures by the Security Council to call for a ceasefire. Meanwhile, an increasingly brutal Israeli regime of systemic subjugation in the West Bank compounds Palestinian suffering. The horrors that have unfolded over the last few months, the 7th of October attack on Israel, the destruction of the Gaza Strip, and the oppression in the West Bank underscore the desperate need for realizing the two-state solution. In the context of this grim reality, the court's advisory opinion is appropriate, it is urgent, and it is necessary. Far from prejudicing the negotiating framework, the court's opinion will reinforce the contours of the two-state solution. Indeed, that solution must be consistent with international law. In the Wall opinion, the court recognized that a negotiated solution and the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel must be on the basis of international law. This is also what the Security Council reaffirmed most recently in Resolution 2720. These pronouncements make clear that a negotiating process could not and must not lead to a result that is contrary to international law. And it is self-evident that a negotiating process that results in the contravention of peremptory norms of general international law would be void. By their very nature, peremptory norms are non-negotiable. The fact that a solution is negotiated does not mean that it should not be principled. By responding to the questions posed by the General Assembly as regards Israel's violations and their consequences, the court will be advising on legal questions directly relevant to the two-state solution. In so doing, the court will aid efforts to realize the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. This could not be more pressing. Moreover, as the State of Palestine observed in its oral statement on Monday, the court's exercise of its advisory function can and has served to advance deadlock negotiations, as occurred with its Chagos opinion. There is a similar need for the court's advice on the Palestinian question, which is characterized by prolonged stalemate and frustrated negotiations while Israel continues to change facts on the ground. Mr. President, the 56 years of occupation of Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, have been shaped by Israel's consistent grave violations against the Palestinian people. The UAE is confident that the court has before it ample evidence to assist its identification of those violations and determination of their legal consequences. As I turn to my second point, I will outline briefly how the situation has severely deteriorated since July 2023. Under international law, the Gaza Strip is occupied territory. Gaza is also one of the most densely populated places on earth. For over four months now, and after enduring 17 years of blockade, its population of over 2.2 million has been under siege. Faced with severe restrictions on water, food, and other essential goods, the level of human suffering faced by civilians in Gaza, predominantly women and children, is on a scale seldom seen in the modern era. Israel's indiscriminate attacks on the Gaza Strip have caused massive civilian casualties and the extensive destruction of homes, schools, and hospitals. Some 75% of Gaza's total population is displaced. I note here, Mr. President, the latest orders issued to the Israeli Defense Forces to plan for the evacuation of Rafah ahead of another military offensive. 
That offensive would leave the approximately 1.5 million displaced Gazans taking refuge in the city with nowhere to go. These plans have been met with the international community's resounding rejection. Israel has imposed a policy of collective punishment against the Palestinian people in violation of Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Israel has repeatedly issued so-called evacuation orders that in effect seek to transfer Palestinians forcibly in violation of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Israel has also failed its duty of ensuring the food and medical supplies of the population in Gaza in violation of Article 55 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Israel has further failed to protect the wounded and the sick in violation of Article 16 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Each passing day is met with further violations of international humanitarian law. And while the eyes of the world are trained on its brutal military operation in Gaza, Israel's violations in the West Bank have intensified. As submitted to the court, a number of Israeli acts in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, constitute grave breaches under the Fourth Geneva Convention. Israel's conduct also violates the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, which lies at the heart of these proceedings. 2023 was by far the deadliest year for Palestinians in the West Bank since the United Nations began keeping records, more than tripling the previous high in 2022. 2023 also saw the highest levels of settler violence yet recorded by the United Nations. The freedom of movement of Palestinians has been severely impacted, including for Palestinian farmers seeking to harvest their lands in the West Bank. Demolitions of Palestinian property have also reached their highest levels. This puts into stark relief the magnitude of this latest iteration of the Israeli settlement enterprise that erodes key components of the Palestinian people's right to self-determination, including the denial of access to ancestral lands and control over natural resources. In addition, there has been an intensification of Israeli settlement construction that undermines the viability of the two-state solution. According to the Secretary General, 2023 saw the highest reported level of Israeli approvals and support for settler housing in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. I raise these recent developments to underline that the violations at the core of the questions posed by the General Assembly are not static. After decades of violent dehumanization, dispossession, and despair, the breaches resulting from the Israeli occupation in all parts of the occupied Palestinian territory are worsening at an alarming pace. I will now focus on Israel's long-standing violations in East Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city of unique cultural and religious depth and texture that has occupied, through history, a place at the crossroads of cultures and civilizations. The city of Jerusalem has the unique feature of being sacred for all three Abrahamic religions and is home to a host of holy places. This feature has put a special imprint on the city's character and the international community has accordingly underlined the need to preserve Jerusalem's unique spiritual and religious dimensions. If Jerusalem has, throughout its long history, represented one thing, it is tolerance. In the words of UNESCO, more than any other place in the world, Jerusalem embodies the hope and dream of dialogue between cultures, civilizations, and spiritual traditions, a dialogue through which mutual understanding between peoples may flourish. Such is the unique historical nature of Jerusalem that an Israeli official once cautioned that anyone depriving Jerusalem of these contrasts, anyone upsetting the equilibrium by trying to make one factor predominant over another, would make Jerusalem cease to be herself. 
Jerusalem is a place of enormous significance to hundreds of millions of people worldwide. On account of their artistic, religious, and historical value, the old city and the holy places are of exceptional importance to all humanity. Jerusalem's unique character has given rise to specific legal obligations as regards the rights of religious communities, including specific guarantees of access to the Christian, Jewish, and Islamic holy places. Since 1757, it has been the case that whoever holds Jerusalem is bound by this legal and historic status quo. As early as 1948, the Security Council urged all governments and authorities concerned to take every possible precaution for the protection of the holy places and of the city of Jerusalem, including access to all shrines and sanctuaries for the purposes of worship. The concerns that motivated the Council then still remain. In 2023, the Security Council called for upholding unchanged the historic status quo at the holy sites in Jerusalem in word and in practice. Israel has, in agreements with Jordan and with the Holy See, committed to the historic status quo and freedom of access to the holy places in Jerusalem. In the wall opinion, the court relied on such bilateral agreements, observing that they were part of the specific guarantees of access to holy places. It is therefore gravely disconcerting that Israel has taken and continues to take measures which undermine the special character of Jerusalem and erase its cultural heritage. Israel is in breach of its obligations by repeatedly interfering with the holy places and hindering freedom of access to them. Since the start of the occupation in 1967, Muslims and Christians have been impeded from worshiping at their holiest sites. Also in breach of the historic status quo are Israel's excavations in Jerusalem. Excavations and tunneling, particularly in and around the old city, imperil its historical, cultural, and religious character. The works are carried out despite the serious risks to the integrity of Muslim and Christian holy places. The General Assembly has determined that these acts are flagrant violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Turning to the question of settlements, the Ring settlements in East Jerusalem contribute to the further isolation of the city from the rest of the occupied Palestinian territory. They thereby undermine the viability of East Jerusalem as the capital of an independent Palestinian state. This is fast becoming a fait accompli. Mr. President, Israel's measures to extend its administration and laws to East Jerusalem are inconsistent with the most fundamental tenets of the law of occupation and the right to self-determination. Indeed, Israel's administration of East Jerusalem constitutes annexation of territory on which the Palestinian people have the right to self-determination. International law is unequivocal in this respect. All measures by Israel that affect or aim to alter the status of East Jerusalem are null and void and have no legal effect on its status. By Resolution 478 of 1980, the Security Council affirmed that Israel's enactment of the basic law was a violation of international law. Resolution 478 was plainly intended to be legally binding on Israel and all UN member states. A binding determination by the Security Council to the effect that a situation is illegal must have consequences. As the court noted in the Namibia opinion, it would be failing in the discharge of its judicial functions if it did not declare that there is an obligation to bring such a situation to an end. Israel's violations in East Jerusalem and throughout the occupied Palestinian territory threaten the viability of the two-state solution and go to the very nature of the occupation. It is in this context that I come to the legality of the occupation itself. 
the Security Council reaffirmed in 1980 the overriding necessity for ending the prolonged occupation of Arab territories occupied by Israel since 1967. The General Assembly has declared that the Arab territories occupied since 1967 have continued to be under illegal Israeli occupation. Israel's occupation is, as the vast majority of participants in these proceedings have recognized, illegal and must end. Israel's occupation breaches the requirement under the law of occupation that an occupation must be temporary and cannot become permanent. It is in breach of the cardinal principle enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations that the acquisition of territory by war is inadmissible. Israel's occupation furthermore violates peremptory norms of general international law, such as the Palestinian people's right to self-determination. Mr. President, whether the illegality of Israel's occupation is determined under general international law or under the Charter, the conclusion is the same. It is illegal. Israel's illegal acts cannot remain without consequence, which takes me to my last point. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, I will now address the legal consequences of the ongoing violations by Israel. I wish to draw the court's attention to the obligations identified by the court in the Chagos and Wall opinions. First, Israel has, inter alia, an obligation to comply with the primary obligations it has breached, an obligation to ensure cessation of those breaches, and an obligation to make reparation for the damage caused by those breaches. Let me illustrate these obligations with a few examples. This means that Israel must cease all policies and practices impeding the exercise of the Palestinian right to self-determination and repeal all laws and regulations that aim to alter the demographic composition, character and status of East Jerusalem. It also means that Israel must ensure freedom of access to the holy places and respect the legal and historic status quo. This means that Israel must comply with all its obligations as the occupying power in the occupied Palestinian territory in East Jerusalem, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. For example, Israel must bring into the Gaza Strip the necessary food and medical supplies to the Palestinian population and it must end its siege and all practices depriving Palestinians of, su of, of supplies essential to their survival. In practical terms, it must mean a ceasefire. It also means that Israel must stop its so-called evacuation orders and forcible transfers of Palestinians. It means that Israel must dismantle settlements in the occupied, pal settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory and must prevent violence perpetrated by settlers, many of them armed against Palestinians. And it means that Israel must put an end to its settlement activities, its confiscation of land, demolition of homes, and the transfer of new Israeli settlers to the occupied Palestinian territory. Finally, Israel must also comply with all decisions of the Security Council in line with Article 25 of the UN Charter. This includes the binding decisions in Resolutions 478, 2334, 2712, and 2720. The UAE further submits that the erga omnis and use Kogan's character of norms violated by Israel also give rise to obligations for all states. First, no state may recognize as lawful the situation resulting from Israel's unlawful conduct, nor render assistance to maintain such a situation. Second, states are under an obligation to cooperate to bring to an end Israel's serious breaches. Additionally, state parties to the Geneva Conventions must ensure respect for those conventions. These obligations may translate into different actions from one state to another. The UAE believes that diplomatic engagement and dialogue 
can be effective tools to encourage compliance and cessation of unlawful conduct. But where these tools fail, third states' obligations <coughs> remain, as do the other instruments of the international system, including the General Assembly, the Security Council, and the court that sits in this great hall of justice. As the permanent representative of a country that has just completed its term on the Security Council, I wish to invite the court to consider the following. The obligations to cooperate and to ensure respect for international law carry implications for states in the exercise of their vote on the Security Council. Voting against or preventing the adoption of a Security Council resolution that seeks to put an end to serious breaches of international law cannot be compatible with such obligations. Israel's violations also have implications for international organizations. The organs of the United Nations can and should take all steps within their respective mandates with a view to ensuring an end to those violations. The UAE remains firmly committed to play its part in supporting the principles of international law which underpin the international system. The UAE considers that the court's advice on the questions before it is critical. Indeed, we believe it matters for all states, large and small, who rely upon and seek to preserve our international order. The reason it matters is quite simple. The even-handed application of international law is essential if that order is to function. To allow otherwise, to permit states to pick and choose what international law to apply and when risks destabilizing our international order. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, the Palestinian people have suffered for far too long under an occupation that is seemingly immune from international law. Palestinians and Israelis deserve to thrive side by side in their own independent, prosperous and secure states. This cannot happen if Israel's violations persist. Peace will remain elusive while the Palestinian people's inalienable right to self-determination continues to be denied. The UAE has every confidence that the court's opinion will contribute significantly towards achieving a peaceful resolution of this conflict in accordance <coughs> with international law. Thank you. I thank the delegation of the United Arab Emirates for its presentation. I invite the next participating delegation, the United States of America, to address the court. I call upon Mr. Richard Vizek to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the court. I am honored to appear before you today on behalf of the United States of America. The court has a serious and difficult task before it. In the time since the General Assembly first requested this advisory opinion, the international community has confronted the horror of the terrorist attacks of October 7, including the taking of hostages who have yet to be released and the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, which has had severe, widespread, and tragic consequences for Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Violence, including extremist settler violence, also surged in the West Bank. The United States, along with others, is engaging intensively with the Palestinians, with Israel, and with other states in the region and within the United Nations, not only to address the current crisis, but to get beyond where we have been, namely to advance a political settlement that will lead to a durable peace in the region that includes lasting security for Israelis and Palestinians and a path to Palestinian statehood. The Security Council and the General Assembly remain convinced that the Israelis and Palestinians must take the steps necessary to resolve their conflict and create such an enduring peace. These principal organs of the United Nations have laid out and continue to endorse the path to achieve that peace through the principles first articulated in Security Council resolutions 
242, and 338. Those resolutions are the core of the established framework within which the court should address the legal questions before it. This court's advisory opinion will have consequences for the parties to the conflict and for the ongoing efforts of all of those working to achieve a durable peace. It will do so for the Security Council, which bears primary responsibility for maintenance of international peace and security. It will do so for the General Assembly, which requested the court's advice. And it will do so for the other members of the international community. Throughout the, the tumultuous and often violent history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the United Nations has been consistent in its support for the proposition that a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace requires negotiations between the parties to the conflict. As the court can see in the submissions before it, there is broad international support for achieving a negotiated solution to the conflict that will give rise to a Palestinian state, a solution in which two peoples live side by side with equal measures of freedom, security, opportunity, and dignity, and which results in broader in regional integration and stability with respect for the right of all states to live in peace within secure and recognized borders. It is for these reasons that the United States encourages the court to ensure that its opinion preserves and promotes the established framework and the prerogatives of the principal political organs of the United Nations to identify the appropriate measures to address this particular matter of international peace and security. Mr. President, members of the court, it will not be possible in this statement to address every assertion or underlying assumption, including those with which the United States disagrees. Instead, my statement today will proceed in two parts. First, I will discuss the established framework set forth and endorsed by the Security Council and the General Assembly, as well as the widespread recognition that the parties must return to that framework as the pathway to durable peace. I will then address guiding considerations for the important role the court should play in preserving and promoting that framework. Mr. President, members of the court, the first time the General Assembly sought this court's advice in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the court recognized that, and I quote, this tragic situation can be brought to an end only through implementation in good faith of all relevant Security Council resolutions. In particular, resolutions 242 adopted in 1967 and 338 adopted in 1973. This statement remains as true today as it was then. As the Security Council, the General Assembly, and the international community have consistently affirmed and as many of the submissions in these proceedings recognize. As set out in our written submissions, the established framework for achieving a comprehensive and enduring peace is anchored in Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338. At their core, these and subsequent resolutions call for the application of two interdependent and inseparable requirements for a just and lasting peace. One is the withdrawal of forces from occupied territory, and the other is peace and security for states in the Middle East through acknowledgement of the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of every state in the area. In identifying these interdependent requirements, the Security Council decided that the withdrawal of Israeli forces relies on and is bound together with the termination of belligerency, mutual recognition and respect for the right of Israel and every other state in the region to live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries, free from threats or acts of force. This principle is referred to by both the Security Council and the General Assembly as land for peace. In the years since, these interdependent and inseparable, inseparable requirements have been the organizing principle of historic peace agreements, first between Israel and Egypt, and then between Israel and Jordan. They were also adopted by Israel and the Palestinians in the Oslo Accords, 
though the promise of Oslo has yet to be fulfilled. The framework built upon these requirements remains the only basis for achieving a comprehensive peace in the region and between the parties. The Security Council and the General Assembly have reflected this time and again in their respective resolutions. This framework also remains the basis for ongoing U.S. efforts to facilitate a lasting peace. Earlier this month, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken traveled to the region for the fifth time since October 7 and discussed the sets of commitments that all parties would need to make. As he explained, there will be difficult choices necessary to realize the vision of the long elusive prospect of true peace and true security. He also reinforced that the diplomatic path to a just and lasting peace and to true security for all in the region continues to be a path to an Israel that is fully integrated into the region with normal relations with the countries of the region and with firm guarantees for its security. He underscored that this must include a concrete path to, Palestinian, to a Palestinian state living side by side in peace and security with Israel. The United States is not alone in this effort to achieve and sustain the goal of the established framework that the Security Council and the General Assembly have created and continue to endorse. Countries and, and organizations around the world, some of which are participating in these proceedings, continue to reiterate the imperative of reviving the peace process and urgently achieving the two-state solution. Our written comments collect a number of statements made to that effect. Mr. President, members of the court, I turn now to the second part of my statement and the important role the court can play in preserving and promoting this established framework. The court has appropriately recognized that its role in rendering an advisory opinion is to assist the requesting UN organ while taking care to avoid a result that could undermine the determinations of the Security Council and its primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. This feature of the court's advisory function has several important implications for the court's work in this proceeding. I will discuss three of them. First and fundamentally, the court should not take up the suggestion of some to interpret the questions in this proceeding as encompassing the entire question of Palestine. The request seeks advice only with respect to the legal consequences of the conduct of one of the parties to the underlying conflict. This one-sidedness, which contrasts with the reciprocity inherent in the established framework, necessarily must inform the, co the court's approach to this advisory proceeding. Second, Contrary to the assertions of some participants, in calling for the court to take this measured approach to the question referred, the United States is by no means suggesting there is no, rule, no role for the court, nor is it the position of the United States that the court must refrain from considering violations of international law or the legal consequences thereof. Participants who have said as much have misunderstood us. Our argument is grounded in respect for the UN Charter and the roles and responsibilities assigned to the UN's principal organs. The court's advisory function was designed to assist the UN's principal political organs in the proper performance of their respective functions. In exercising its advisory role, the court must necessarily consider the extent to which the Security Council and General Assembly have taken action to address the matter of international peace and security particularly where, as here, they have directly and repeatedly endorsed a specific framework for achieving peace. None of the Security Council's resolutions has suggested altering or departing from this framework. In fact, as recently as late December, the Council, in Resolution 2720, reiterated its, and I quote, unwavering commitment to the vision of the two-state solution where two democratic states, Israel and Palestine, live side by side in peace within secure and recognized borders, consistent with international law and relevant UN resolutions." End quote. 
and at around the same time, the General Assembly likewise stressed in Resolution 78-192, quote, the urgency of achieving without delay an end to the Israeli occupation that began in 1967 and a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace settlement between the Palestinian and Israeli sides based on the relevant resolutions of the United Nations, the Madrid Terms of Reference, including the Principles of Land for Peace, the Arab, the Arab Peace Initiative, and the Quartet Roadmap to a permanent two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. International law has a central and important role to play here. Within the established framework, the Security Council itself, including in recent resolutions 2172 and 2720, has demanded that all parties comply with their obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law. And within the framework, the Council has also sought to remove obstacles to the achievement of a two-state solution including the establishment of civilian settlements, destruction of infrastructure, demolition of homes, and the failure to prevent acts of terrorism. The Council has likewise emphasized that the parties should be held to their commitments. For example, Security Council Resolution 1850 notes the irreversibility of the bilateral negotiations between the parties and urges, and I quote, an intensification of diplomatic efforts to foster in parallel with progress in the bilateral process, mutual recognition and peaceful coexistence between all states in the region in the context of achieving a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in the Middle East. In any consideration by the court of these or other issues, the challenge for the court is how to provide its advice in a way that promotes the framework rather than disrupting its balance, potentially making the possibility of negotiations even more difficult. In this regard, it would not, as some participants suggest, be conducive to achievement of the established framework to issue an, to issue an opinion that calls for a unilateral, immediate, and unconditional withdrawal by Israel that does not account for Israel's legitimate security needs. Whatever the court's opinion on the legal consequences of particular violations of international law, such an outcome would be contrary to the established framework, which the Security Council and General Assembly have structured around the two interdependent and inseparable elements, not only withdrawal, but also the conditions necessary for peace and security for all states in the region. An enduring peace requires progress on both of these balanced elements. In addition, as noted in the U.S. written comments, the establishment of this framework by the Security Council and General Assembly is a salient feature of these proceedings, distinguishing it from other proceedings. Mr. President, members of the court, as Secretary General Guterres remarked just a few weeks ago in connection with ending Israel's occupation. Quote, a lasting end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can only come through a two-state solution. Israelis must see their legitimate needs for security materialized, and Palestinian, Palestinians must see their legitimate aspirations for a fully independent, viable, and sovereign state realized, in line with United Nations resolutions, international law, and previous agreements. Under the established framework, any movement towards Israel's withdrawal from the West Bank and Gaza requires consideration of Israel's very real security needs. We were all reminded of those security needs on October 7, and they persist. Regrettably, those needs have been ignored by many of the participants in asserting how the court should consider the questions before it. In sum, it is important that the court keep in mind the balance that the Security Council and General Assembly 
have determined is necessary to provide the best chance for durable peace. Mr. Pre Mr. President, members of the court, I turn now to my third point. In carefully considering how its advice might best support progress within the established framework, the court should not deviate from longstanding principles of international law, including with respect to the law of belligerent occupation. As set out in the written submissions of the United States, international law does not provide for an occupation itself to be rendered unlawful or void, based either on its duration or on any violations of occupation law. Under international humanitarian law, a belligerent occupation is established when the customary international law standard reflected in Article 42 of the Hague 4 regulations is satisfied. The fact of an occupation is the basis for the occupying power to exercise its authority over occupied territory. The fact of an occupation is also the basis for the application of the legal rights and duties applicable to an occupying power. For example, the Fourth Geneva Convention prohibits an occupying power from transferring parts of its own civilian population into territory it occupies. Even if an occupying power violates such a prohibition, as has been argued in this proceeding and as the, car, as, and as the court found in construction of a wall, the legal status of the occupation would not change as a consequence because the occupation continues in fact. Importantly, this means that the protections of occupation law, including its protections for civilians, would continue to apply. We were surprised to hear that some have questioned in this proceeding the U.S. position on the illegality of acquisition of territory by the use of force. We have repeatedly stated our strong opposition to any unilateral attempts to change the peacefully established status of territories by force or coercion anywhere in the world and have reaffirmed that the acquisition of territory by force is prohibited. And as our written statement made clear in reference to this and other situations, the Security Council and the General Assembly have declared that any actions to change the status of occupied territory are null and void and do not affect the continued application of the Fourth Geneva Convention. With respect to duration, international law does not impose specific time limits on an occupation. That said, Belligerent occupation is a temporary measure for administering territory under the control of belligerent armed forces. A few days ago at the Munich Security Conference, Secretary Blinken emphasized that it is more urgent than ever to proceed to a Palestinian state, one that also ensures the security of Israel and makes the necessary commitments to do so. In light of these considerations, the court should not find that Israel is legally obligated to immediately and unconditionally withdraw from occupied territory. The, the court can address the questions before it within the established framework based on the land for peace principle and within the parameters of established principles of occupation law. Mr. President, members of the court, as I said at the outset, you have a difficult task before you. Others have asked you to broadly construe the questions and the law. They have asked you to try to resolve the whole of the dispute between the parties through an advisory opinion addressed to questions focusing on the acts of only one party. The United States disagrees with that, that this approach would be consistent with the court's role within the United Nations or the established UN framework for achieving peace through negotiations. Hamas's attacks, hostage taking, and other atrocities, the ongoing hostilities and the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza, and the violence in the West Bank reinforce the United States' resolve to urgently achieve a final peace that includes the full realization of Palestinian self-determination. The current crisis illustrates the vital need to achieve this peace 
this final peace with a Palestinian state living safely and securely alongside a secure Israel, fully integrated into the region. As Secretary Blinken said, quote, we're not going to have durable security for Israel unless and until Palestinian political aspirations are met, end quote. The lack of meaningful progress on a negotiated end to the conflict and establishment of peace between the parties and for the region cannot and must not persist. The Security Council and General Assembly continue to make clear their support for the two-state solution and the established framework to fulfill it. This conflict cannot be resolved through violence or unilateral actions. Negotiations are the path to lasting peace. For these reasons, we respectfully encourage the court to carefully calibrate its advice in this proceeding to support and promote final realization of peace and stability within the established UN framework set out in Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338. Mr. President, members of the court, this concludes the oral statement of the United States. I thank you for your kind attention. I thank the delegation of the United States of America for its presentation, which brings to a close this morning's hearing. The court will meet again this afternoon at 3 p.m. to hear the Russian Federation, France, the Gambia, Guyana, and Hungary. The sitting is adjourned.
Swiss Pop
Ist du die Zeit, wo alles ist endlos gegangen? Ist noch die Tage, wo ich sie durchgegangen? In Träumen verschwunden, drinnen bleiben hangen. Es war nie mehr so einfach. Gewesen. Heute geht jeder Tag so schnell an mir vorbei. Bin immer klein, hinten drin. Zwischendurch mache ich meine Augen zu. Verschwinde in der Fantasie. Komm, wir machen es wieder Peter Pan. Und legen uns ein bisschen nebeneinander an den Strand. Bitte weg im Himmel lang. Er kommt zu mir, bleibe lang miteinander. Es ist so lang her. Es ist so weiter weg. Wir machen es wieder Peter Pan. Was ich am Traum hat gehabt. Und im Traum hat gehabt. Die Liebe ist schon längst weg. Der Traum, der dann ist, hat nicht wirklich gelebt. Die Zeit, die ging zu viel war, hat sich verzogen. Und schon ich mir sie gemerkt, verflogen. Heute geht jeder Tag so schnell und mir vorbei. Bin immer klein, hinten drin. Zwischendurch mache ich meine Augen zu. Verschwinde in der Fantasie. Komm, wir machen es wieder Peter Pan.
Thanks you. 
Sometimes everything seems awkward and large Imagine a Wednesday evening in March Future and past at the same time I make use of the night, start drinking a lot Don't know the deal for now, it's all that I've got It's nice to know your name You don't know Ocean Lake, I need a place to drown Let's freeze a moment, cause we're going down And Tomorrow you'll be gone, gone, gone You're laughing too hard, this all seems surreal I feel peculiar, now what do you feel? You think there's a chance that we can fall? You don't know Gave up dreaming for a while ah, I gave up dreaming for a while I've noticed these are mysterious days I look at it like a cheats a puzzle and gaze Wide open mouth and burning eyes If only I could 
should start to care My dreams and my Wednesdays ain't going nowhere Baby, baby, baby You don't know, you don't know You don't know, you don't know anything about me What do I know, I know your name You don't know, you don't know You don't know anything about me Depend on you. I gave you all the love I had in me. And now I find you lied, and I can't believe it's true. Wrapped in our arms, I see you across the street. I see you across the street. And I can't help but watch. What's going on? Oh, you talk of love, but you don't know how it feels when you realize that you're not the only one. To walk away, I tried to walk away, but it's not that easy when your soul is torn in two.
Radio Suisse Pop. I come running to you like a moth into a flame You tell me take it easy but it's easier to say Wish I didn't need so much of you I hate to say but I do We're sleeping on our problems that will solve them in our dreams We wake up early morning and still under the sheets I'm lost in my head, I'm spinning again Trying to find what to say to you Never been so defenseless Never been so defenseless You just keep on building up your fences But I've never been so defenseless Fatto apposta per noi due 
yes, you know, we're out of control. And you know, yes, yes, you know, we're going for it all. this 
Radio Swiss Pop. Ein Musikprogramm der SRG SSR. I'm just sitting here And I'm thinking of you I'm so grateful That we ain't through I was waiting For the hour I would lay my eyes on you It's been a long time I didn't see the best of you For all the good times we had 
in all honesty I want to thank you for that warming memory I had some hard times when I walked away from you and me It's been a long time I didn't see the best of you The mailman delivered your lines Times of sad despair A broken heart, my lonely soul Little hope to mend or halfway repair Lonely years just slip me by Just the thought of you had me sigh What can a man What can a man like me do but sit and cry It's only human To reach out and touch someone I reached out and touched Yes, I did Wishing you would be the one It's been too long, my love So many years have come and gone And it's been a long time I didn't see the best of you I love you, I love you, I love you It sounds corny, but it's true Now that I'm holding you here And you say you'll love me too You just whisper in my ear Oh baby, what you want me to do It's been a long time I didn't see the best of you It's been a long time I didn't see the best of you Such a long, long time I didn't see the best of you In the middle of our streets, our house 
Just the kids are playing up downstairs Sisters sighing in her sleep Brother's got a night to keep He can't hang around Our house In the middle of our street
Swiss Pop Ain't got no cigarettes out but two hours of pushing broom buys a eight by twelve four bit room I'm a man of means by no means king of the road Trailers for sale rent Rooms to let 50 cents No phone, no boo, no pets I ain't got no cigarettes uh, But two hours of pushing Du hast recht I think I feel too much no. Einfach noch ein bisschen gehen Und ich weiß, ich stopp mich selber Und ich weiß, ich darf es mir wagen Loszulassen Wenn ich blocke Musterkreuz und quer verfüllt im Kopf Löse sich nicht von heute auf morgen
to the bar Hang around till they shut it down I bet you wanna show everyone That you're doing a lot better now I bet you got a hotel room With a single bed for two I bet you're all alone And that's why you're hitting up my phone Saying that you want me back But I know you don't You just wanna know Bet you wanna know You don't wanna know If I'm good Or if I'm barely getting by You just wanna show Up when I find another guy You're scared he's gonna compare to You or do me better than you Secrets that I'm keeping I bet you wanna know What I'm doing without you And I bet you wanna know Where I'm at tonight If I'm all up on someone new I like Bush lights sipping Midnight kissing Did it lead us back to my place? Did he drive me off or did he stay? Till the sun rose Did we lose our clothes? How far we go? I bet you wanna know Time. 
time to come I'll never wanna be like you I'm never gonna be, never gonna be like you Radio Swiss Pop. Music. Pure. Five o'clock in the morning. I'm still waiting for you to come home. And I guess my Yeah. 
I miss you. Your name's still on my coffee cup. I miss you. The way you chose the films we watched. I miss you, babe. If only I had told you that before. Maybe I would never have to miss you. Singing by the kitchen sink. I miss you. Not knowing I was listening. I miss you, babe. You embody everything that I am not. And now I'm just somebody you forgot. I wish it was a year ago. I wish that I could hold you close. Now I'm driving past your house. I know the lights are on. You're not alone. I wonder if you make it last. I wonder if he loves you like the way you said that only I. Could do. I wish that I could tell you that I miss you. I miss you. The way you left my car a mess. I miss you. The way you took up half the bed, that empty space. You remind me of the things that I am not. And now I'm just somebody you forgot. I. That I could hold you close the way you said that only I could do. I wish that I could tell you that I miss you. Bum 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 bum.
du moins je l'aurais juré Pour ceux qui ne le connaissent pas Il est comme vous et moi Un kaleidoscope Dans l'or et la lumière J'étais à un droit de le tuer Par le feu ou le fer Mais les contrepoisons Je vous 
Please be seated. The sitting is open. The court meets this afternoon to hear the Russian Federation. France, the Gambia, Guyana, and Hungary on the questions submitted to it by the United Nations General Assembly. As I have had the occasion to note, each delegation is kindly requested to keep to the maximum speaking time of 30 minutes for its presentation. This afternoon, the court will observe a short break after the presentation of the Gambia. I shall now give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation, His Excellency Mr. Vladimir Tarabrin. You have the floor, Excellency. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it's an honor for me to be representing the Russian Federation at these hearings. Seizing this opportunity, I would like to congratulate you, Mr. President, Madam Vice President, and all the new judges of the court upon election to your respective positions. We trust that the court, in its new composition, will continue making its immeasurable contribution to peaceful resolution of disputes and development of international law. Mr. President, the current proceedings originate in the adoption by the General Assembly of Resolution 77 stroke 247 back in December 2022. When adopting the resolution, the General Assembly was gravely concerned by the tension and violence in the recent period throughout the occupied Palestinian territories. The Assembly noted the continuing systematic violation of the human rights on the, of the Palestinian people by Israel, the occupying power, including that arising from the excessive use of force and military operations causing death and injury to Palestinian civilians. The Assembly also spoke of the arbitrary imprisonment and detention of Palestinians, the use of collective punishment, the closure of areas, the confiscation of land, the establishment and expansion of settlements, the destruction of property and infrastructure, the demolition of Palestinian homes, the forced displacement of civilians, and the disastrous humanitarian situation and the critical socio-economic and security situation in the Gaza Strip. As has been stressed by numerous delegations speaking at these hearings, the situation on the ground has since, has since uh, deteriorated in a dramatic fashion. The Gaza Strip, since October 2023, has been an area of intense hostilities. This time, violence has taken an unprecedented and indeed a catastrophic scale. The overall number of victims during the current wave of violence, almost 30,000, has already surpassed the figure from any of the previous Arab-Israeli wars. Images from Gaza are terrifying. Indiscriminate uh, airstrikes are killing civilians and erasing whole residential districts. More than half of all buildings in the Gaza Strip have been destroyed. Up to 90% of Gazans have been forced to leave their homes and are living in inhuman conditions. Against the backdrop of the tough Israeli blockade, the Gaza Strip is experiencing a genuine humanitarian catastrophe. Its inhabitants are suffering from an acute sh shortage of food, medication, and fuel. Access to sources of clean water has been limited, resulting in a spread of, of infectious diseases. Over 20% of agricultural lands have been damaged and will never be recultivated. Mr. President, Russia, of all countries, understands the dangers of terrorism. We have uh, faced this evil time and again. Let me use this opportunity to reiterate our heartfelt condolences to the Israelis who lost their loves, uh, loved ones in the attack on the 7th of October. <clears throat> Brutal massacre of innocent people, 
taking of hostages and other terrorist violence do not have and cannot have any justification. We have repeatedly condemned such acts. Let me also stress that Russia highly values the stable relations that we enjoy with Israel. We are united by shared history of combating Nazism, as well as by a myriad of present-day human ties. Our, cooper our cooperation is resilient in the face of geopolitical turbulence, and we are committed to its further development. Having said this, this uh, we are convinced that the tragic events of the 7th of October cannot justify the collective punishment of more than two million Gazans. We cannot accept the logic of those officials in Israel and some Western countries who try to defend the indiscriminate violence against civilians by referring to Israel's duty to protect its nationals. Violence can only lead to more violence. Hatred brings hatred. This vicious circle must be broken. In Russia's view, security both for Israel and the Palestinians can only be ensured if the root cause of the current crisis is addressed. Outbreaks of violence will inevitably occur again until the Palestinian people, having suffered for decades from injustice, exercises its right to establish an independent state. That state, in accordance with, with the Security Council and General Assembly resolutions, is to emerge within the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. Only this approach, based on international law, can bring a lasting peace for the region and security for Palestinians and Israelis alike. This is the spirit that, we have, uh, that uh, has been guiding Russia in fulfilling its responsibilities as a mediator between Palestine and Israel, notably as a member of the so-called Quartet, alongside uh, the United Nations, the United States, and the European Union. <clears throat> the history of the conflict shows uh, what happens when Security Council resolutions are ignored and influential global actors are in incapable of or unwilling to help the parties uh, find consensual solutions. Attempts to put the conflict into a low-intensity mode instead of a comprehensive settlement have time and again provoked eruption, eruptions in the occupied territories. The current wave of violence is no exception. It was preceded by a persistent policy of the United States and its allies aimed at freezing the status quo, watering down the political processes, the, uh, promoting a one-sided vision of a settlement. Among the victims of such sh short-sighted and irresponsible approach was the quartet of mediators, those uh, of, of mediators whose work has been effectively blocked by the United States. This flawed policy of Washington has predictably led to a failure that uh, has cost thousands of innocent lives. Today, all responsible members of the international community are facing a difficult task of creating conditions to lead the situation out of the current impasse. After the violent phase has been overcome, the parties will need help in establishing a full-fledged political dialogue, allowing them to settle all disputes on the universally recognized international legal basis. Russia hopes that uh, the advisory opinion of the court will, con will contribute to achieving this goal. Mr. President, a lot has already been said in uh, this hall on the numerous violations of international law by Israel. Uh, Russia supports the assessments given in the General Assembly Resolution 77-247 and the respective reports of the Secretary General. We also support the relevant resolutions of the, of the Human Rights Council based on the reports of its Special Rapporteur. In today's statement, let me focus on two of the most important aspects. First, the first one 
is the persistent denial by Israel of the right of Palestinians to self-determination. The right to self-determination through the establishment of an independent Palestinian state has been at the heart of efforts of the international community. This right has been recognized by the General Assembly, the Security Council, and by this Court. It's worth recalling that the principle of self-determination of peoples is one of the foundations of the United Nations, mentioned in the very first article of its charter. Every state has the duty to refrain from any forcible action which deprives people, peoples of uh, their right to self-determination. Meanwhile, as recognized by the General Assembly, the protracted Israeli occupation prevents the Palestinians from implementing that right. Uh, an end to the Israeli occupation has been identified as a goal for the international community by legally binding resolutions of the Security Council, including Resolution 2334. Israel is accordingly under an obligation to cease its violations of international law and to allow the Palestinian people to establish an independent state. This necessarily means that the occupation must come to an end. The other key problem that leads to continuous violations of human rights of Palestinians are the Israeli settlement activities. This policy, sometimes referred to as creating creation of facts on the ground, was launched back in 1967 and has led to progressive shrinking of Palestinian lands. This has effectively undermined prospects of a negotiated solution uh, of, the, of the one element of the final status, namely the issues of territory and borders. The overall number of Israeli settle, settlers in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, <coughs> is over 700,000. The situation is exacerbated by other arbitrary moves by the Israeli authorities, such as confiscation of lands, demolition of homes, and prohibition of new construction. Most recently, this has been accomplished by, uh, accompanied by violence emanating from Israeli settlers. In 2023, that is after the present request for an advisory opinion was made, the settlement activities of Israel have gained a record-breaking speed. This according to the, uh, thus, according to the latest reports of the United uh, Na Nations Secretary General, in 2023, plans for more than 24 seven, uh, 700,000 uh, uh, housing units were advanced, approved, or tendered. This is more than double than 11,700 units in 2022, which in itself was a remarkable figure. During the current wave of violence, we have witnessed public statements by Israeli cabinet members announcing plans to resume settlement activities in the Gaza Strip. Thus, on uh, the 28th of January 2024, at a conference in West Jerusalem, cabinet ministers openly called for deportation of Palestinians from Gaza and presented a map with 21 settlement blocks. One cannot help noting that the event was held two days after this court indicated provisional measures in the South Africa versus Israel case. The court agreed that the situation in Gaza poses risks of irreparable harm to the rights of Palestinians guaranteed by the Genocide Convention. This fact alone underscores the gravity of the situation. In this connection, it's worth recalling that, the, that this court, in its advisory opinion on the wall, recognized that the Israeli settlement in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, had been established in breach of international law. As explained in that advisory opinion, 
The settlements are contrary to the principle of inadmissibility of acquisition of territory by force. They also contradict the provisions of the Fourth Geneva Convention, pro prohibiting uh, transfers of population and deportations from the unoccupied territory. Resolutions of the Security Council have characterized that uh, policy as changing the legal status and geographical nature of the occupied territories and materially affecting their demographic composition. In its resolution 2334, the Security Council reaffirmed that the settlements have no legal validity and constitute a flagrant violation under international law and the major obstacle to the achievements of the two-state solution and the just, lasting, and comprehensive peace. This policy is aggravated by numerous violations in order of other rules of international humanitarian law and human rights law. These include the right to life, to respect for private and family life, to property, to freedom of movement, to freedom of religion, to work, to health, to education, and to an adequate standard of living. As mentioned earlier, this policy continues unabated in defiance of Security Council resolutions and the Quartet Roadmap. Importantly, as stressed in Resolution 2334, the settlements are dangerously imperiling the viability of the two-state solution based on the 1967 lines. They are thus also violating the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. Israeli policies in Palestine, to Russia's deep regret, include other international law violations. Many examples have been provided by other delegations here. The Russian Federation expects the court to give them due consideration. Mr. President, members of the court, the question before us, therefore, the legal consequences of those violations. The, st the starting point here is uh, the well-established rule whereby every internationally wrongful act of a state entails its, uh, the international responsibility of that state. In the present proceedings, the court will be right to conclude that uh, Israel's violations result in Israel's duty to comply with the obligations it had breached to put an end to its ongoing violations and to provide reparation for the damaged cost. This means, uh, first and foremost, that Israel is under an international legal obligation to respect the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination and to stop all settlement activities in the occupied territory. Given the particular legal framework in the Middle East peace process, Israel is also under an obligation to cease all activities that impede reaching a final status agreement based on the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination in an independent, viable, and contiguous Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Having said that, uh, the court will be wise not to engage in a detailed discussion on the, on the precise scope and forms of implementation of Israel's responsibility. This is important for two reasons. First, advisory proceedings before the court are not an exercise in implementation of responsibility. No state is invoking Israel's responsibility in these proceedings, as indeed Israel is precluded from invoking responsibility of others. A state may only be brought before this court on the basis of its own consent. Full respect for the principle of consent is a crucial importance for the integrity of international judicial procedures. Secondly, the international community has established a solid legal framework for the Middle East peace process. This legal framework is a universally recognized and a legally binding one. It contains crucial elements that effectively coincide 
with the aims of international responsibility. A negotiated two-state solution with an independent, viable, and contiguous Palestinian state peacefully coexisting with Israel will be the best recipe for bringing an end to Israeli's violations, creating guarantees of their non-repetition, and redressing the damage. The uh, advantage of the peace process is an idea of direct negotiations between Israel and Palestine. Uh, they are to reach an agreement on the basis of their free will. In Russia's opinion, that significantly strengthens the chances that an agreement will actually be achieved, will indeed satisfy the interests of both parties, and will be implemented in practice. The Russian Federation invites the court to be guided by the need to contribute to creating conditions for successful final status negotiations. The best contributions, co contribution uh, would be a confirmation by the court that Israel and Palestine are under an obligation to resume such negotiations, while all states and international organizations shall cooperate in order to make that possible. In its written statement, the Russian Federation has discussed the status of the court as one of the principal orgers or organs of the United Nations. The court has on many occasions recognized that its advisory opinions represent in partic uh, its participation in the activities of the organization. When asked by the General Assembly to provide an advisory opinion, the court should give an opinion that would indeed be useful for the Assembly. For these reasons, we respectfully submit that the court, when giving an advisory opinion in this case, should be guided by the principles of the peace process and should actively seek to give an opinion that would contribute to their implementation. Mr. President, today I will not dwell upon issues of jurisdiction, admissibility, applicable law, or interpretation of questions put by the General Assembly. The respective chart, uh, chapters of the written contribution of the Russian Federation retain their full relevance. Let me now summarize our submissions. The continued Israeli occupation of Palestine impedes the realization of the Palestinian people of its right to self-determination. Israeli settlement are contrary to the principle of inadmissibility of acquisition of territory by force. They also run counter to the prohibition of transfer and deportation of population of an occupied territory. The settlement activities are aggravated by numerous other violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law. All states are under an obligation not to recognize the illegal situation resulting from Israel's violations. Israel shall terminate its breaches of international law. It must, in particular, cease all settlement activities and all other activities that impede reaching a final status agreement. At the same time, discussion on Israel's responsibility must remain within the limits imposed by the advisory nature of these proceedings and uh, to the need to create conditions for successful final status negotiations. Israel and Palestine are under an obligation to conduct in good faith and without delay negotiations aimed at reaching a final status agreement. All states and international organizations are under an obligation to contribute to creating conditions for such negotiations. The agreement uh, thus reached shall result in the implementation by the Palestinian people of its right to self-determination and emergence of an independent, viable, and contiguous Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. This will bring an end to the ongoing violations of human rights of Palestinians and to the Israeli occupation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the delegation of the Russian Federation for its presentation. 
J'invite maintenant la délégation. I now invite uh, the next participating delegation, France, that is, to address the court. And I call on Mr. Diego Colas to the podium. Sir, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it is a signal honour for me to represent my country before you. Allow me an introduction to return, if I may, to the very consequential context of these audiences, of these hearings. 7 October 2023, Israel underwent a terrorist attack of unprecedented scale. France condemned this in the strongest possible terms, the attack perpetrated by Hamas and the other terrorist groups, and expressed its full solidarity with Israel and the victims of said attack. Now, as did the court in its order indicating provisional measures of 26 January 2024, France called for the immediate and unconditional freeing of those hostages kidnapped by Hamas and the other terrorist groups during the attack on Israel in October. France would also like to recall the right of Israel to defend both itself and its population to ensure that uh, such attacks as these do not occur again in the future. But this right has to be exercised in full compliance with international law and specifically in compliance with international humanitarian law. When Israeli bombing and military operations created thousands of civilian victims in Gaza, France asserted this requirement time and again, clearly and steadfastly. The protection of civilians and aid workers is both a moral imperative and an international obligation. Israel must comply with international humanitarian law, which dictates at all times and in all locations clear principles of distinction, necessity, proportionality and precaution. Let me add that the compliance with international law, and specifically international humanitarian law for all parties involved, gives the only possible outlook for peace. France took note of the concerns expressed by the court in its order of 26 January as to the fallout of military operations which are taking place in the Gaza Strip. The court's concerns regarding, I quote, the extent of the human tragedy unfolding in the region and the human suffering which we continue to deplore can only be shared by my country. As the French Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs recalled during its intervention, the Security Council of the United Nations on 23 January, we must work forthwith towards a ceasefire, a sustainable and durable ceasefire which alone will put an end to the sufferance and the suffering of uh, the civilian population in Gaza. By handing down an advisory opinion in the instant proceedings, the court can make a valuable contribution to the just and durable settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Indeed, an opinion could usefully contribute to the clarification of the framework and legal parameters applicable to this situation. It will then fall to the parties involved, supported, of course, by the international community, to seek a negotiated solution for lasting peace consistent with international law. In this respect, France repeats its unwavering support for a negotiated two-state solution, coexisting side by side within secure and recognised boundaries based on the lines of 4 June 1967, both having Jerusalem as their capital. Indeed, for France, only a two-state solution will meet both the right of Israelis for security and to the legitimate aspirations of Palestinians for a viable, contiguous and independent state living in peace and security alongside Israel. To this end, France calls for a decisive and credible restarting of the peace process. The current situation in Israel and Palestine raises a large number of questions of international law, but only some of them are raised by the questions posed by the General Assembly. And in France's opinion, it is vital that the scope of the instant proceedings be precisely delineated. 
It will thus be the task of the court to provide the General Assembly with an opinion which, while shedding light on the legal questions posed, goes no further than is necessary to do so. Mr President, distinguished members of the court, seen holistically and following the order of questions put to the court, my statement will deal on the five following points. First of all, right to self-determination, occupation, colonisation and annexation, discriminatory laws and measures, the status of Jerusalem and legal consequences. Before diving into these five points, I would like to make an initial observation on applicable law. To have a comprehensive view of the legal framework relevant to the request for this opinion, it should be pointed out that Palestine has become a party to a number of multilateral treaties since 2004, which was since your opinion, with a non-exhaustive list that can be found in our written comments. First, self-determination. The right of the Palestinian people to self-determination was recalled by the court in its opinion of 2004. The Security Council has also reiterated this on numerous occasions. The existence of a Palestinian people within the meaning of international law is no longer a matter of debate. As such, like all peoples, they enjoy the right to self-determination. Pursuant to this law, to rehearse the terms of Article 1 shared in both the 1966 covenants, all peoples freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. That's a quotation. Thus, regarding the Palestinian people, this right, first of all, has a political dimension. This dimension, broadly, broadly enshrined by various General Assembly resolutions, it is characterised by the right of, to an independent Palestinian state and by the right of the Palestinian people to exercise their sovereignty over their territory and to accede to, excuse me, to accede to independence in their state. This perspective fits fully within the vision of a region in which two states, Israel and Palestine, live side by side within recognised and secure boundaries. Any solution for peace will necessarily first require security arrangements being concluded between Israelis and Palestinians, providing concrete and efficient guarantees. At the same time, these security guarantees can only exist if in future a real Palestinian state exists, able to conclude such arrangements and ensure their compliance. That's to say, a state capable of exercising full sovereignty within its internationally recognised boundaries. In this context, France is of opinion that any action running counter to the necessity to preserve the unity, continuity and integrity of the entirety of the OPT, including East Jerusalem, is a violation of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. From this point of view, the continuing occupation, but also the development of settlements and the fragmentation resulting from these settlements, undermines the creation of a viable state of Palestine. The longer the attacks to the integrity of the OPT continue and increase, the further the perspective of such a state recedes. More fundamentally, the continuation of those breaches attributable to Israel threatens the possibility for the Palestinian people to effectively exercise their right to self-determination. To this end, the finding by the port in 2004 remains, but the passage of time is not neutral. It hampers the perspective of the Palestinian people's right to self-determination being realised. Just about 20 years after the advisory opinion handed down by the court on the legal consequences of the building of a wall in occupied Palestinian territory, the multiplication of measures accompanying it and the development of settlements create an equal number of barriers to the self-determination of the Palestinian people. OK, my second point now. Let me come to the question of occupation colonisation and uh, prolonged annexation of the Palestinian territory occupied uh, by Israel since 1967. Now, two points here. First, the legal consequences of the prolonged character of Israel's occupation, then the question of whether this extended occupation, together with the question of colonisation, implies an ongoing violation. 
Well, occupation is a de facto objective situation characterized by one state exercising effective control over a given territory. Since the end of the Six Day War in 1967, Israel can be considered as the occupying power of West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip within the meaning of Article 42 of Hague Regulations of 1907 relative to the laws and customs of war. This de facto situation, noted by the court and by the UN Security Council, assumes that the international norms of um, provided for in case of occupation, military occupation, will be applied. These norms establish the rights for the occupying power in Australia to maintain security, not compromise military needs. But above all, they impose positive obligations, of which the principle is the protection of populations subject to occupation. In this respect, the Security Council and the General Assembly have recalled a number of times the obligations of Israel under the Fourth Convention of Geneva relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war. That's 12 August 1949. These international norms apply independently of the lawfulness which enabled the state to exercise its effective control over the occupied territory. They apply whatever the length of occupation, even though essentially occupation should be considered as being temporary. The obligations of protection apply to rehearse the terms of Article 6 of the Fourth Geneva Contention during the duration of the occupation. With the occupation of Palestinian territories lasting since 1967, the prolonged character seems difficult to justify by the necessity of war within the meaning of Article 23G of the Hague Regulations of 1907. Indeed, circumstances justifying occupation during the period following immediately military occupation, uh, military operations, excuse me, may not be invoked several decades after these operations have ceased. That's what led the Security Council and General Assembly to ask the Israeli armed forces to withdraw from these territories a number of times as in numerous resolutions. In France's opinion, the indefinitely prolonged character of an occupation is contrary to the fact that this should be, by very nature, provisional. Occupation is a de facto question which gives rise to a specific legal regime. The fact that it is prolonged in itself doesn't mean that it's wrongful. But the danger here would be a finding of wrongfulness which would lead to this regime no longer applying. That itself would lead to a result which is manifestly absurd and unreasonable, where civilian populations would be deprived from the protection offered by the regime a protection that's all the more necessary the longer the occupation continues. Uncertainty on the applicable legal framework is all the more prejudicial in the current context of Israeli military operations in the Gaza Strip, territory over which Israel now exercises reinforced control. In this territory today, the affected civilian population must absolutely and necessarily, at the very minimum, be entitled to enjoy the rules of protection provided for by the occupation law. Occupation. Turning to my second point, the link of the colonization policy of occupied Palestinian territories. Colonization of occupied territories, contrary to Geneva Convention's Article 49 of the 4th, Geneva Convention provides, and I quote, occupying power cannot deport or transfer part of its own civilian population in the territory that it occupies, end of quote. The Security Council on several occasions condemned this uh, situation. In its opinion, 2004, the court also concluded that, I quote, uh, the Israeli settlements in occupied uh, Palestinian territories in East Jerusalem was established in breach of international law, end of quote. This state of um, unlawfulness remains all the more grounded that since 2004, Israel's continued accelerated its policy establishing or extending settlements in occupied Palestinian territories. On this question, France reiterates its firm condemnation of the um, illegal settlement policy by Israel, particularly in the current context. This uh, uh, policy includes eviction of Palestinian families and destruction of properties, must see war in Gaza, 
in no way constitutes a pretext to continue to impose on the ground unilateral measures that undermine the prospects for a two-state solution, the only one that can guarantee a just and lasting peace. In a joint statement, 15 December 2022, France reiterated its position pertaining to the settlement policy illegal under international law. Recall Israel the obligations incumbent upon it under international law, particular Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, fast also firmly convinced violence committed by extremist settlers who terrorize uh, Palestinian communities, end of quote. Sur ce dernier point. On this um, latter point, France has taken measures on a national basis against certain violent Israeli settlers and stated that it supported uh, the adoption at Euro European level san of sanctions against them. Uh, furthermore, it needs to be recalled that the status of an occupying power confers absolutely no legal title justifying an annexation. In this regard, the fact that occupation is particularly prolonged can in no case legitimize the annexation claims. Quite the contrary, one of the cardinal principles of international law is that prohibiting this form of annexation as this emerged from Resolution 2625. No territorial acquisition obtained through the threat or use of force shall be recognized as legal, end of quote. In this context, an annexation of a territory that would seek to be based on the extended nature of uh, occupation can only be considered as null and void under international law. Thirdly, the question posed by the General Assembly also relates to the legal consequences of discriminatory laws and measures adopted, related and adopted by Israel. In France's view, this question refers to the laws and measures applied to occupied Palestinian territories, but in contradiction with the international uh, regime provided for, for occupied territories. The laws and measures that present a discriminatory nature contravene not only the provisions uh, cited of the conventions of the Hague and Geneva, but also international texts in terms of human rights that bind Israel applicable to occupied Palestinian territory. France notes that international humanitarian law doesn't necessarily um, exclude that a differentiated status may apply to the population of an occupied territory status cannot, however, justify the adoption of laws and measures that would be discriminatory. As the court set out in its uh, 2004 opinion, protection offered by HR conventions do not cease in the case of armed conflict. The right of occupation must therefore be implemented taking into account applicable human rights law. The occupying power is in particular required to exercise in rights and duties by taking into account the obligation of non-discrimination which uh, stems notably from Article 2 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The question posed to the Court also relates to the measures aimed at uh, amending the composition of the uh, demographic composition of the territory. France's view is that international law clearly prohibits the implementation by the occupying power of measures that would modify the demographic composition of the considered territory. In this regard, France reiterates its uh, condemnation of pronouncements promoting the installation of settlements in Gaza and the transfer of the Palestinian population of Gaza outside this uh, territory. France recalls that the court set out the obligation for Israel to take all measures in its power to prevent and punish such statements like in the West Bank or elsewhere such a modification of the demographic composition of the Gaza Strip would indeed uh, constitute a serious violation of international law, both conventional and customary. 
Fourthly, Mr. President, members of the court, I now come to the question of the status of Jerusalem. Through many of its resolutions, notably Resolution 478 of 1980, the Security Council affirmed the uh, internationally uh, wrongful nature of measures taken by Israel to amend the status of Jerusalem, including the basic law of 30th of July 1980 that proclaims Jerusalem as uh, one and indivisible as capital of Israel. Resolution 478 and 1980 recalls the adoption of this basic law does not challenge the application of the Fourth Geneva Convention. There is therefore no doubt that the unilateral status imposed by Israel and Jerusalem is null and void under international law. Furthermore, the protective uh, measures set out in the Fourth Geneva Convention must apply to Jerusalem as in the uh, remaining occupied Palestinian territories. Thus, the expropriation of Palestinian land in East Jerusalem, but also the status which applies to Palestinian in East Jerusalem, constitute a breach of the ob obligation of the occupying power to take such protective measures. In effect, it's not just the military measures that contravene um, Israel's obligations and occupying power, but also the measures of Israeli civilian law applied to Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Israel, under international law, is more broadly required not to adopt legislative or other measures aimed at modifying the status of Jerusalem. As recalled in the Presidential Declaration of the Security Council of 20th of February 23, France considers it necessary to maintain unchanged the historical status quo on holy places in Jerusalem. Fifthly and finally, the request for an advisory opinion of General Assembly covers the legal consequences arising from the violations of international that might be noted by the court. In this regard, it's useful to recall that in its uh, 2004 opinion, the court responded by distinguishing the legal consequences from Israel and those for the other states and where appropriate for the United Nations organization itself, the same will apply for these oral observations. As regards Israel, the first legal consequence is the obligation of cessation of what is wrongful under Article 30 of Articles 2001 of the ILC on the state responsibility for international wrongful acts, the uh, state responsible for a wrongful act is under obligation to put an end to it if that act continues. An examination of the situation in occupied Palestinian territory reveals continuous violations of international law to which Israel must put an end. These violations relate, as we've seen, to the people's right to self-determination on international humanitarian law and international human rights law applicable to the situation in occupied Palestinian territories. Are notably concerned the transfer of Israeli population as part of the illegal settlement policy conducted by Israel and the discriminatory or restrictive measures of certain rights and freedoms of the Palestinian population in the occupied territories. This obligation must be called with even greater force that in the context of the current tensions, the settlement policy is doubled with an increase of violence uh, committed against Palestinians in the West Bank. The obligation of cessation has both uh, legal as well as material consequences. As part of the current proceeding, the cessation obligation requires that policies and practices that uh, violate international law must end. It also implies the rescinding of domestic uh, 
legal acts on which they're based, as well as positive action to uphold international law. The second legal consequence stemming from a violation of international law is reparation as part of the current request for an advisory opinion. France considers the, this reparation obligation extends to all damage caused to the Palestinian population resulting from Israel's policies and practices that don't comply with international law. As a general rule, the reparation obligation must, as far as possible, take the form of restitution and, failing that, compensation if uh, restitution no longer possible. As regards uh, violations of the Palestinian people as a whole, collective or symbolic forms of reparation should be considered. Lastly, in respect of satisfaction, Israel would be required to conduct investigations and prosecute where appropriate person responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law committed in the occupied Palestinian territories. As regards the other states, the court had already noted in its 2004 opinion the erga omnes nature of international obligations breached by Israel during the construction of the wall in occupied Palestinian territories. As part of this request for an advisory opinion, the same situation applies regarding the infringement of people's rights to self-determination regarding from the prolonged occupation by Israel and Palestinian territory, as well as policies and practices implemented in occupied Palestinian territories. There results for all states an obligation of non-recognition of a situation that is a grave breach of international law. No form of annexation, including partial, can be recognized under international law. In this regard, in the occupied Palestinian territories, as everywhere else, France will never recognize the illegal annexation of territories. Upholding the international status of occupied Palestinian territories also carries with it effects from the economic standpoint. We'll recall in this regard that in Resolution 2334 of 2016, the UNSC requested all states to distinguish in their uh, dealings in this regard between the territory of the State of Israel and occupied territories since 1967. This leads, in the case of EU law, the inclusion of international law in the opinion of the court in 2004 in order to distinguish products depending on their origin. As regards the United Nations organization, it could, as was the case, uh, set out where appropriate the follow-up to be given to the opinion of the court regarding the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination and the risks of undermining the international status of occupied Palestinian state, notably guarantees offered by the status to the Palestinian population. Lastly, it must be recalled the court had requested in 2004 the United Nations as a whole to redouble its efforts to rapidly uh, bring an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to establish a just and lasting peace in the region. This uh, request to embark on peace negotiations between the parties, supported by the international community, remains more than rel ever relevant. France is ready to provide its support, all efforts undertaken in its regard. Mr. President, members of the court, I thank you for your attention. Je remercie la délégation de la France pour son exposé. I like to thank France's delegation for its presentation. The Gambia to make its oral statement before the court. I thus call upon His Excellency Mr. Dauda Jallo to take the floor. Mr. President, honorable members of the court, it is an honor for me to appear before you to present the Republic of the Gambia in these essential advisory opinion proceedings. 
As was the case with the Gambia's written statement, my oral submission today focuses on the second question presented to the court regarding the legal status of the occupation and the legal consequences that arise therefrom. The preamble of the UN Charter reminds us the fundamental goals of our international system to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of human persons in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained, and to promote social progress, better standards of life, in large freedom. Mr. President, members of the court, notwithstanding the great resources invested by the international community at large, none of these goals have been achieved for the Palestinian people. None of them. And none of these goals can be achieved for the Palestinian people until Israel's illegal occupation of the Palestinian territories is brought to an end. My remarks today will focus on three points. First, I will discuss the fact that a belligerent occupation can, can, be, can be illegal, per se, under certain circumstances. Second, I will set forth three reasons why Israel's prolonged occupation of the Palestinian territories is illegal, a view shared by a substantial majority of the states participating in these proceedings. Third, I will conclude by emphasizing the essential role of this court in declaring that Israel's occupation is illegal and must be brought to an end immediately. As the court knows quite well, the international system is based on certain fundamental principles of law, which includes peremptory norms of international law or just cordial norms. Adherence to these norms is not subject to derogation and compliance with them is owed erga omnes to the international community as a whole. Some of the recognized just cordial norms include prohibition of aggression, prohibition of genocide, the prohibition of appetite, and the right to self-determination. If, if a particular action of a state viola violates one or more just cordial norms, that action is illegal under international law. Any state may invoke the responsibility of that state for such a violation and seek an immediate end to it. This is fundamentally the situation regarding Israel's occupation in the Palestinian territories. The international community, collectively over many years, has found Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories to be illegal, among other reasons, on account of its violations of multiple Juscordian norms. And collectively, we have invoked Israel's responsibility in that regard to end the occupation. Mr. President, at least one state in the course of these proceedings has suggested that on an occupation under international law cannot be illegal under any circumstances. This argument poised, the, poised that. This argument proceeds that an occupation exists, therefore it's legal. The proposition is unfounded in international law and fails for several reasons. First, this argument confuses Jews in Belo and completely ignores the Jews at Belo. As the court is well aware, international humanitarian law and the Jews in Belo is the body of law that governs the ways which warfare can be conducted. It includes within it the law, the law of occupation, a body of rules regulating the conduct of occupying power. It is indeed true that the obligations under Jews in Belo as they relate to an occupation persist throughout the pendency of the occupation. But separate from jus in bello is the jus ad bellum, or the conditions under which state may resort to armed force. It is the jus ad bellum that addresses the legality of use of force, including an occupation, which is maintained by ongoing use of force. Article 2.4 of the UN Charter prohibits the threat or use of force in any manner inconsistent with the purpose of the United Nations. The only exceptions to this prohibition are the very narrow circumstances of the force authorized by the UN Security Council or self-defense under Article 15 of the Charter. Any use of force outside of these narrow exceptions, that is, any 
any ex annexation or occupation of territory arising from an act of aggression or otherwise unlawful use of force is illegal. Any use of force that is unnecessary, disproportionate to the threat against which it is exercised is also illegal under jus ad bellum. Second, the proposition that an occupation exists, therefore it is legal, also ignores the existence and implications of jus cogent norms go going beyond the jus ad bellum. If an occupation inherently violates one or more jus cogent norms, then it is illegal as a whole, and the occupying power's responsibility for that violation can be invoked in order to bring the violation to an end. The occupying power's ongoing obligation under international humanitarian law do not and cannot preclude the wrongfulness of jus cogens violations inherent in the occupation itself. For example, the argument that occupations are inherently legal if adopted would directly conflict with and undermine the pro prohibition on the annexation of territory. Any state that wanted to de facto annex a territory could do so by indefinitely occupying that territory but not formally incorporating it within its borders. It is the same with the jus cogent norms of the rights of self-determination. Simply put, flagrant violations of international law cannot be brushed aside by the fig leaf of occupation. Finally, the fifth is that an occupation exists, therefore it is legal, also ignores the fact that the court has determined occupations to be unlawful in the past. As discussed in the Gambia's written statement, this was the case regarding South Africa's occupation of Namibia without title and regarding Uganda's occupation of the Congolese province of Ituri. The UN Security Council and the General Assembly have characterized occupation resulting from unlawful uses of force to be illegal as well. In sum, a belligerent occupation can be illegal per se if it violates the jus ad bellum and other jus cogent norms. Mr. President, members of the court, the Gambia will highlight three reasons why Israel's prolonged occupation of the Palestinian territories is illegal. All three of these reasons, the right of self-determination, the prohibition on appetite, apartheid, and the jus ad bellum, reflect obligations rooted in jus cogent norms. This conclusion of illegality is shared by a substantial majority of the participants in these proceedings, many for the same reasons as the Gambia. First, Israel's occupation violates the right to Palestinian people to self-determination and is therefore illegal. The Ergaomnes right of self-determination is one of the essential principles of contemporary international law and just cogent norm enshrined in the UN Charter. The court has before its extensive and uncontested fact-finding, sorry, the court has before it extensive and uncontested fact-finding multiple UN mandate holders, including the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Occupied Palestinian Territory and the many reports of the Special Repertoire on the Situation of Human Rights in Palestinian Territories occupied since 1967. These reports have been produced by independent UN mandate holders who engage in extensive fact-finding utilizing multiple sources of evidence. The court should accept these reports as conclusive and convincing evidence of Israel's long-standing, ongoing, and indefinite infringement on the rights of self right of self-determination for the Palestinian people. Indeed, there is no end in sight to Israel's occupation. Already extending over 56 years, Israel's current leadership boasts with pride its long-standing efforts to prevent the creation of an independent Palestinian state. As reported by the UN Special Repertoire, Israel's occupation violates Palestinians' ability to organize themselves as a people, free from alien domination and control. No derogation is permitted from respecting the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. There is no escaping the conclusion that Israel's occupation is illegal for violating the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination and that it must expeditiously be brought to an end. Second, 
Israel's ongoing occupation of the Palestinian territories is also illegal because it amounts to regime of apartheid, the prohibition of which is a peremptory norm of international law. This court has described apartheid as flagrant violation of purposes and principles of the Charter. Once again, the court has before it extensive, credible, and independent fact-finding fact -finding demonstrating conclusively that Israel has imposed an apartheid reality in the Palestinian territories. This is clear in the reporting of the UN Special Rapporteur, who concluded that Israel has imposed upon Palestine, Palestine an apartheid reality in a post-apartheid world. This is also reflected in the findings of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Senior international leaders like Ban Ki-moon, <coughs> Desmond Tutu, and former Israeli officials, including former Attorney General, former Director of Israel's Intelligence Service, Sin Bet, and former Ambassador of Israel to South Africa, have also concluded that Israel's occupation constitutes a regime of apartheid. The most credible non-government human rights organization that report on the situation in the occupied Palestinian territory have also concluded that the occupation is, in fact, and in law, apartheid regime. A sober review of the uncontroverted evidence convincingly shows that the occupation is a regime of apartheid. As such, Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories is illegal as, and must urgently be brought to an end. Third, Israel's 56-year occupation of Palestinian territories violates the laws on the use of force, just ad bellum, and is illegal for, what, for that reason as well. As discussed earlier, the prohibition on the threat and use of force as a just cogent norm, even then resort to force is justified by self-defense in response to an armed attack, the particular force used may still be illegal if it is unnecessary or disproportionate to the threat against which it is exercised. Israel launched the June 1967 war that led to its occupation of the Palestinian territory. After its surprise attack initiating the war, Israel occupied all remaining Palestinian territory in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, as well as Syria, Golan Heights, and Egypt in Sinai Peninsula, effectively tripling the size of the territory under its control. Since this use of force was not taken in response to an armed attack and was not necessary or proportionate even if it had been, the occupation was flagrant violation of the laws of the use of force from the onset. Furthermore, even if the occupation of the Palestinian territories were lawful at one time, its continuation for more than five decades means that it could not possibly still be lawful today. First, the use of force in self-defense is only justified within the strict confines laid down in Article 51 of the Charter and does not allow the use of force by a state to protect perceived security interests beyond those parameters. As such, essentially, preventive use of force are beyond the scope of Article 51. Second, as clarified, <coughs> as clarified in the World Advisory Opinion, Secondly, as clarified in the World Advisory Opinion, Article 51 does not apply to situations involving conduct taken in response to purported threats emanating from the within occupied territory. Israel therefore cannot justify its occupation as a response to illegal threats emanating from within the occupied Palestinian territory itself. Israel's ongoing occupation of the Palestinian territories also violates the Jews ad bellum because its maintenance is unnecessary and disproportionate. It is simply not possible that it has been necessary for Israel to maintain its occupation since 1967 for over 56 years. Moreover, Israel also cannot possibly justify its settlements upon an annexation of occupied territory as a necessary response to any perceived threat 
not to mention the myriad of rights violations that are intrinsic to the occupation. By settling and annexing occupied territory, Israel has acted unnecessarily in using force. Israel's prolonged occupation is also wholly disproportionate to any legitimate aim. Israel's occupation of, entirely, and Israel occupation of the entirety of the Palestinian territories, long after the period in which they presumed armed attack, could reasonably be contemplated, makes it even more disproportionate now. And the manner in which the occupation has been conducted, con conducted including the establishment of an apartheid regime, renders the occupation disproportionate as well. In sum, Israel's decades-long occupation violates the Jews at Belom and is therefore illegal. Mr. President, members of the court, in the almost 20 years since the World Advisory Opinion, Israel has only deepened the occupation. Israel has annexed more territory and expanded its illegal settlements. It has further fragmented the Palestinian territory. In Gaza, Israel has decimated the territory and the Palestinian population there. In the territories overall, Israel has entrenched an apartheid regime. The Palestinian people continue to be deprived of their right to self-determination indefinitely. And all the while, there is no justification under international law for Israel's continued use of force to maintain the occupation, if there ever was one to begin with. Mr. President, members of the court, I remind us of the fundamental goals of the United Nations that I recited at the beginning of my remarks. If we are to ever achieve any of those goals in regard to the Palestinian people, then this court must play its role in robustly answering the question posed by the General Assembly. As to the second question posed, the Gambia submits that the court should find Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories is illegal, per se, for all of the reasons discussed. And the Gambia further submits that the court should find that Israel, all other states, and the United Nations are under an obligation to bring about an end to Israel's occupation immediately, or at least as rapidly as possible. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the court, for your kind attention. I thank the delegation of the Gambia for its presentation. Before I invite the next delegation to make its oral statement, the court will observe a break for 10 minutes. The sitting is suspended. When I'm afraid
It started with a kiss The back row of the classroom How could I resist The aroma of your perfume You and I were inseparable It was love at first sight
seen Yeah, all my friends caught up in the cloud I miss the days we were just hanging out A smartphone's now
don't do it to get rich. You don't do it to get famous. You don't do it for those reasons. You do it because you love to play music. The only thing 